各位同事 ，Members, good morning. This is the first meeting of the panel in the year of the tiger. So may I wish everybody good health. And I like, and I hope that uh, everything goes smooth with our work. And this is also the first time we conduct this meeting via Zoom. I understand that some members are still in the process of switching the Zoom background to the appropriate color. For the FC members, please use a green background. And for members returned by the election committee, please use orange. And for GC members, you should use purple. And if you have any difficulty, please contact the Secretariat staff. They will help you figure it out. And may I, remember, may I remind members that during this meeting, you should make sure that the video camera is on and that your face should be shown on the screen. So we have a quorum and I call this meeting to order. First, may I remind members that, well, let me repeat because I've just said it. During the meeting, please use the virtual background function in Zoom to show the appropriate background colors. Now, let me repeat the colors to be used. For members returned by EC, please use orange. And in fact, the colors have been assigned by the Secretariat before the meeting. So make sure you switch to the appropriate color on your laptop. And for members returned by FC, please use green. For GC members, please use purple. And if there are questions, please send me a message and I will ask our technical staff and the secretariat staff to contact you. When you speak at the meeting, please make sure there is a video signal via Zoom and please show your face on the screen. As for the mic, it will be controlled by our technical staff and the mic will only be switched on uh, upon my instruction. And if a member wishes to speak, please indicate that by using the raise hand function in Zoom. I may not be able to keep an eye on all the screens at the same time, so please click that button so that you can speak uh, according to the order, you click the button. As for other meeting arrangements, just like a physical meeting, we have simultaneous interpretation service. And you can choose the language channel on Zoom. And this meeting, likewise, will be broadcast online at the website of the Legislative Council. So, item one on the agenda, information papers issued since the meeting on the 25th of January 2022. Uh, there is one paper which has already been forwarded to members. And then date of the next meeting and items for discussion. The next regular meeting is scheduled for the 14th of March 2022 in the morning. The administration proposes to discuss four items. First, 
budget for financial year 2022-2023 for the insurance authority. Number two, budget for financial year 2022-2023 of the MPF authority. Number three, budget for financial year 2022-2023 of the Financial Reporting Council. And then number four, regulation of licensed money lenders. Do we agree? Okay, thank you. Now we move on to the next item. Briefing by the Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury on the Chief Executive's 2021 Policy Address. So let me welcome Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury and other representatives to our meeting. Well, this is the first meeting we conduct via Zoom. So let me remind members that to allow members to speak in an orderly and fair manner, First of all, those who indicated uh, by using the raise hand function before, the hands will now be uh, removed and then I will invite members to indicate by using the raise hand functions again and then I will invite members to speak in turn. But before that, let me first invite Mr. Christopher Hoy, Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, to deliver his opening remarks and please be as brief as possible. Chris, thank you, Chairman. First of all, uh, let me say Happy New Year to everyone. And now let me explain the five major areas relating to the initiatives in the 2021 policy address. First is consolidating our advantages and contributing to the nation. The focus is to deepen the mutual market access with the mainland market so as to connect the mainland with global capital and investors. Our progress in this regard includes the cross-boundary wealth management connect and southbound trading under Bond Connect respectively launched in September 2021, as well as the MSCI China A50 Connect Index Futures in October 2021. And we'll strive for early implementation of the ETF Connect initiative. And we'll strive to bolster Hong Kong status as a global offshore RMB business hub under the national 14 five-year plan. We're conducting a feasibility study on allowing securities eligible for southbound trading under Stock Connect to be denominated in renminbi. The Shenzhen Municipal People's Government issued offshore renminbi municipal government bonds of renminbi 5 billion in Hong Kong in October last year, enriching our spectrum of renminbi financial products. In respect of interest paid or profits received arising from this batch of debt instruments will exempt the payment of profits tax. With the mainland bond market becoming the second largest in the world and largest in Asia, there have been calls for facilitating MPF investment in bonds issued by the central government. To this end, we plan to introduce legislative amendments to the relevant laws to incorporate the Central People's Government, the People's Bank of China, and three policy banks in the mainland into the list of exempt authority. We also plan to provide in the subsidiary legislation future power to designate other governmental bodies and policy banks in the mainland as exempt authority so as to facilitate MPF investment in bonds issued by them. Meanwhile, we will improve the listing regime on various fronts. The listing regime for companies from emerging and innovative sectors was implemented in 2018. And on the 1st of January this year, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange took a further step to enhance the regime for listing of overseas issuers, including to allow overseas listed greater China companies from the traditional sectors and without weighted voting rights structures to secondary lists in Hong Kong, and to provide greater flexibility for dual primary listed issuers. We've also implemented the listing regime for special purpose acquisition companies, SPAC, to strengthen the competitiveness of Hong Kong as a premier listing platform around the globe. 
and to achieve the goal of enhancing Hong Kong's function as an international asset manage management center under the National 14 Five-Year Plan, we've completed a three-step exercise to enhance Hong Kong's position as an international asset and wealth management center by introducing the Limited Partnership Fund Regime, or LPF, providing tax concession for carried interest issued by provide equity um, funds operating in Hong Kong and establishing a redomiciliation mechanism for foreign funds to relocate to Hong Kong. We're studying the relevant tax arrangement to enhance Hong Kong's attractiveness as a family office hub. A task force led by our bureau, comprising members from the Hong Kong MA, SFC and the Inland Revenue Department, is considering the details of the tax arrangement. To fulfill the goals set out under the National 14th Five-Year Plan, we endeavor to strengthen Hong Kong's function as a risk management center by working with the insurance authority to take forward various measures, such as striving for the early establishment of after-sales service centers in the by Hong Kong insurance industry in the mainland Greater Bay Area cities and the early implementation of the unilateral recognition policy for cross-boundary motor insurance. In addition, we plan to introduce legislative amendments into LegCo to implement a risk-based capital regime. We will conduct a public consultation within this year on the specific content of establishing a policyholders protection scheme and, after consolidating public views, prepare the necessary draft bill to better protect policyholders in case an insurance company becomes insolvent. So that's the first area. The second area is actively seeking innovations. Now, the second area is actively seeking innovations. Promoting financial innovation has always been our policy priority. A total of 3.75 billion US dollars equivalent of green bonds targeting global institutional investors was successfully issued under the government green bond program in November 2021. It was also our inaugural offering of euro-denominated and renminbi-denominated bonds, setting an important new benchmark for potential issues in Hong Kong and the region. In addition, the government is preparing for the issuance of retail green bonds within this financial year for public participation. The Green and Sustainable Finance Cross-Agency Steering Group, formed by relevant bureaus and financial regulators, has set up the Center for Green and Sustainable Finance. Following the publication of the Common Ground Taxonomy, or CGT, report by the International Platform on Sustainable Finance, the steering group is exploring developing a green classification framework for adoption in the local market, which facilitates easy navigation among CGT, China, and the EU's taxonomies. The steering group has completed a preliminary assessment of carbon market opportunities for Hong Kong and further exploring the path to develop Hong Kong into a regional carbon trading center. On fintech, we launched the fintech proof of concept subsidy scheme last year with a warm, uh, with warm response from the industry. The Hong Kong MA and the Digital Currency Institute of the PBOC are proactively conducting the next phase of technical testing on using ECNY for marking Make, uh, making cross-boundary payments in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong MA has also started a study on the prospect of issuing e-Hong Kong dollar in Hong Kong and aims to come up with an initial view by the middle of 2022. The Coordination Group on Implementation of FinTech Initiatives, CJFIN, that I chaired, convened its first meeting in December, and the CJFIN will continue to holistically review and supervise various key aspects related to FinTech development with a view to ensuring our policy and regulations are proactive enough to promote the further development of FinTech in Hong Kong. We've also appointed eight general partners so far to the Hong Kong growth portfolio. Through strategic investments in projects with Hong Kong Nexus, we strive to reinforce Hong Kong's status as a financial, commercial and innovation centre and raise Hong Kong's productivity and competitiveness in the long run while seeking reasonable risk-adjusted returns. The third area, talents. That's the last column on this PowerPoint, nurturing talents to prepare for the future. We are developing professional qualifications recognized under the Qualifications Framework, QF, for the practitioners of the fintech sector. We've also added experienced compliance professionals in asset management and experienced financial professionals in ESG, environmental, social and governance, to the talent list Hong Kong to attract foreign professionals with relevant experience. 
after the Hong Kong MA promulgated the Enhanced Competency Framework on FinTech, or ECF FinTech, in December 2021, the Hong Kong Institute of Bankers is applying for recognition by KUF. The six professional qualifications under the framework, which is expected to be completed by 2022. The fourth area is enhancing financial infrastructure and improving regulatory system. Robust and efficient financial infrastructure is crucial to the development of the financial industry. After passage of the relevant bill in LegCo in October last year, the EMPF platform project is now in its development stage. Our target is to complete the user-oriented EMPF platform by around the end of 2022 at the earliest for phased migration of trustees starting from around April 2023 and full implementation around 2025 when all MPF schemes complete migration to the EMPF platform. Meanwhile, we are studying the relevant legislation for implementing the electronic submission system of the Official Receivers Office, OROO, and streamlining the requirements of gazette and newspaper advertisements to enable a more effective handling of insolvencies. Our goal is to introduce the amendment bill to LESCO in 2022. As far as the other ongoing initiatives are concerned, It is important that we have international tax cooperation and promote public sector reform. As an international financial center, Hong Kong has been actively cooperating with the world on tax matters to support higher tax transparency and prevent tax evasion. We'll continue with our work in this regard. We'll also conduct the third round of public sector reform in three aspects, improving service efficiency, enhancing digitization of public services, and consolidating government services. We'll make use of digitalization to manage certain services to keep abreast of the social development and rising public expectations. The Government Property Agency is exploring the development of a digital portal to improve the processing of government accommodation leasing. The Government Logistics Department would partner with the Hong Kong Productivity Council to organize an exhibition on procurement of applied digital technologies and set up a procurement platform for the suppliers to showcase their R&T solutions that can be applied to the operations of government departments for digitizing their work processes and data management. Now, that concludes my presentation, and I'd like to uh, receive feedback from members. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Secretary. Now to open it for two questions, I will um, ask members to speak one by one. Let me read the list. There are 12 members who would like to speak. Any other member wish to raise their hands? Due to time constraints, I may not be able to have a second round of questioning. Let me read out the list. Dr. Wang Yun-san, Starry Lee. Lam Shan Kang, Chen Chen Ying, Li Wei Wang, Tang Wok Hang, Chen Kin Bot, Johnny Chen, Chen Ki Chong, Chen Pui Lun, and Duncan Chu, and Yuan Chi Wing, and Bill Tang. Fourteen altogether. I will draw the line here. And each member. Well, we have uh, four minutes for both question and answers. And please be succinct in your questions. Let me first invite Dr. Wang Yunshan, Vice Chairman. You need to turn on your microphone. Thank you, Chair. Secretary, I'd like to follow up. Well, first of all, I wish everyone a good, happy Chinese New Year. I would like to talk about how do you promote fintech development. The HKMAE HK dollar white paper discussed about uh, the design for a CBDC for retail payment system and if we tie the e Hong Kong dollar with the consumption voucher that we can unleash the potential including shortening the coordination time as CBDC uh, can be scalable and also uh, speed up the rollout. Since the CBDC and the central bank digital currency and linked with the voucher, we can actually speed up the dispensation of vouchers. While as uh, marking a new phase of our e 
Entertainment in Hong Kong, besides different provider, East HGBD and e Hong Kong Dialogue can be considered as an another e-spending platform and take advantage of the e-vouchers. Not only we can be quicker in receiving the consumption vouchers, and also help to promote the growth of e Hong Kong Dollar at a retail level. Secretary, uh, thank you for the question. Let me look at this in a different perspective. For the e Hong Kong Dollar, I went through it briefly. Currently, we're conducting a feasibility study and hopefully by middle of this year, then we can produce some findings. And Dr. Wong raised a quite important question on consumption voucher. In the past, well, uh, the electronic distribution of vouchers is quite was quite effective in encouraging the public to, uh, to make more electronic payments. At the next step, I believe we all care about whether there will be consumption voucher at all. We need to consider holistically, and we are still drafting the budget. Well, for the next step, it's still under wraps. On the other hand, how, how do we make use of technology so that we can improve the provision of services? We will take this initiative forward. In my remarks, not only the we need to face the public, and a lot of government internal processes also need to be digitized. For example, the government property agency is constructing an internal platform for departments. Let's say if the public notice there are a, a pro government property available for lease, well, internally, Well, uh, currently the process is not uh, fully digitized. After full digitization, the whole process will be more transparent, and they can uh, have greater control on have control of their uh, quarters. You do have a point, and not only that we can uh, promote uh, technology to the public and as well uh, inside the government, we can make use of the technology and digitization. Well, in March, we plan for a internal tech fair with the Productivity Council. Well, uh, just like uh, other big companies, we have this platform to uh, gather hundreds of local tech companies and solutions that will, will uh, provide them with a platform to showcase their technology. Well, the government needs to archive a lot of information. Is there any way that we can digitize it to boost the efficiency? And there are also other kind of uh, digitization other services. Well, we can all agree, not only we need to uh, improve our service to the public, we also need to uh, elect, digitize our internal processes. Next, Mr. Lee. Chairman, Secretary, what the since the release of the policy address, it has been quite some time. Unfortunately, um, the pandemic is still with us. Well, since the pandemic, have you noticed uh, any changes to the capital coming into Hong Kong? Well, Hong Kong is a financial center. That despite the pandemic, uh, the impact is not too significant. I hope that the secretary can tell us the latest data. Well, this is the policy address briefing. Well, a lot of the industry in distress due to the pandemic are really need the secretary's help. I believe that there will be another round of anti-epidemic fund, and for the upcoming budget, I hope that you can. Provide some relief for these industries, and ride out this storm. So I would like to hear from the secretary first. Secretary, I thank you, Ms. Lee's question. First, well, uh, what well, the pandemic is not only happening in Hong Kong is is raging worldwide. Therefore, we are sharing the same problem with the whole planet. 
and the chairman has a point looking at the latest figures well uh, even during the riots and so on our financial system has demonstrated resilience say last year well for the stock market the daily turnover is 160 billion it was an increase of 30 percent well in terms of uh, IPO amount and last year uh, we raised over th uh, over uh, 328 billion dollars well as a financial center as a wealth management hub our advantage is still in tech well with uh, the emerging uh, uh, new sectors like technology or well, how can we find a platform for this uh, new emerging industries? For example, biotech. As for end of last year, we have over seventy uh, biotech companies uh, listed according to the new listing rules. Forty-seven of those were pre-revenue or free profit companies. Well, well, uh, well. I know that we're grappling with the pandemic, but in the long run. It, or make our economies become more concerned about uh, ESG and uh, health and hygiene. We can exploit our advantage by providing momentum and financing for these companies in these fields. I believe that we're seeing opportunities along with challenges. Well, Secretary, some follow up. In terms of talent, Especially from the in the financial sector, can you tell us about the net inflows or outflows? I believe you are you referring to that. Well, due to the quarantine requirements, that there will be some population movement. That will uh, disrupt uh, business and deal makings. I believe that this is not unique to the financial sector. A lot of the industries require face-to-face -face interactions. Well, uh, recently we announced that we are uh, reducing the quarantine requirements. The response from the industry has been positive. Well, a lot of people find the 24-day requirement challenging. Now with this uh, upcoming relaxation that it will mix business interactions easier. Uh, in terms of the business sector and the financial service, uh, we are in constant dialogue that without uh, affecting the pandemic control, uh, we are trying to uh, refine his measures. I believe that everyone cares about the talent issue. I believe that maybe for the future meetings, you can provide more concrete information to Ms. Lee's question. Sure. Mr. Chai Cheng, and please change your background color. Next, Mr. Lam Sheng Kang. Chairman, I believe that the secretary had done the math in developing our bond market, especially the renminbi bond market, that the uh, professional services uh, earnings will be a lot more than the charges and fees for gone, amount to $100 million. So I believe that we do not have a lot of talent in this field. I believe that the debt market is an integral part of Hong Kong as a financial hub. I hope that the relevant organizations can look into ways to um, train more talent. We can't simply wait uh, to train people after uh, getting the deals. Otherwise, this opportunity will be snatched by our neighbors.
Well, in last August,、uh, we set up the Hong Kong debt market as development steering group and also a green and sustainable finance、uh, interdepartmental st steering group. The report mentioned that to train、uh, fine tech talent. However, the study did not explore how do we train for the child. For example, accountancy and legal services. The report mentioned about a st. The three subsidy scheme is simply a drop in the ocean. I hope that I can receive more、uh, information on the training. If not, I hope that the FSTB can、uh, study on this matter so that、uh, we can seize this opportunity in this sector. Go. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Lam. Well, you made a very Valid point. First, it's about the focus we should have on the market. The other is on talent development. First, on market development. Indeed, we find the bond market our pri priority, and that is why we've set up a, a group. And we're in the process of、um, collating information, and that、uh, findings are, are not、uh, ready for release. But I think Mr. Lam is also clear in terms of bond、uh, issuance. We have a number of、uh, areas to work on, including supervision, etc. Now, in terms of bond issuance, clearly, legal services will be required. That is why we have a subsidy scheme for green bonds issued in Hong Kong, and we also have、um, a relevant、uh, debt program for green bonds. As far as talents are concerned, I mentioned the three-step exercise on expanding the private、uh, equity market, and we introduced the limited partnership fund regime. Over 400 private equity funds were set up in Hong Kong within a year, largely with the participation of legal practitioners in Hong Kong. The regime has been well received by the legal sector as well. Through the regime, some funds that are unable to be registered elsewhere because of changes in the regulatory landscape could be. Registered in Hong Kong with the help of the legal sector. So let me reassure Mr. Lam,、uh, we will keep a close liaison with your constituency, and、uh, we'll be happy to heed your views on、um, matters relating to your profession. Next, Mr. Ronak Chen. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question for the Secretary. Paragraph thirty-four of the paper refers to enhancing financial infrastructure. Because fintech will be the highlight of the development of the banking sector, I wonder if、um, funding allocation will be reserved for supporting fintech infrastructure, such as developing reg tech or providing further tax concessions on fintech development, so that financial institutions will have a lesser burden on their shoulders in terms of、um, development of fintech. Now, for ECNY,、uh, set out in paragraph twenty-eight, Dr. Wong also referred to the same point, and that、uh, you're in the next phase of technical testing for making cross-boundary payments in Hong Kong, and you are studying the retail,、uh, the use of e Hong Kong dollar. I support these initiatives. Earlier, a question was asked at the Legislative Council. Whether ECNY could be allowed、uh, to be used by banks in terms of cross-boundary settlement. The last question about talents, with very stringent anti-epidemic measures, the government has been criticised for hindering、uh, foreign talents、uh, entry into Hong Kong, and even for banking professionals. 
working outside Hong Kong, it is posing a huge challenge. May I know from the government what measures are available to attract foreign talents uh, coming to Hong Kong and keeping our competitive edge? First, on the point of financial infrastructure, if there is a policy need, we do provide uh, funding. For example, we have EMPF platform, like I uh, mentioned in the opening remarks. We have over 10 MPF trustees involved with the support of chairman and members. We um, sought funding from LegCo so that we could set up this platform and then with lower administrative costs, um, we could benefit all MPF members. Now for Central Money Makers Unit, CMU, the Hong Kong MA is now uh, considering different options. We have, say, uh, Southbound Stock Connect and other initiatives uh, that will help us grasp more opportunities. The other point about talents, Indeed, the pandemic poses a challenge to all countries around the world. And in the midst of the current epidemic, we've introduced the quarantine arrangements. And for the uh, latest uh, quarantine period arrangements, uh, I would say that this benefit the whole sector. Now on talents, there are three questions. First. Where do we find talents? Now, pandemic is transient, and uh, the greatest opportunities lie in the mainland, and that applies to Hong Kong as well. That is why we should uh, expand the market and make it attractive to foreign talents. That is why, like I mentioned, we have um, private FT fund arrangements and EMPF. This is more um, of a fundamental uh, nature. The other point is how we attract foreign talents. In, as mentioned in the policy address, we have the Talent List Hong Kong, and we have actually included the ex experienced professionals in ESG and compliance professionals in asset management so that we could keep abreast with the times as we review the market development and areas of the market with the highest demand for talents. We're sending out a clear signal to the market that these are professionals uh, in demand. Now, of course, at the same time, we should groom local talents and upgrade their skills. For the younger generation, for young graduates, we should focus on grooming them, and that is why we have a scheme. Recently, uh, we collaborated with a cyber port on a fintech program, and we created over 1,000 fintech job opportunities. Over 30% of successful job seekers are young graduates below the age of 30. So this is how we support the younger professionals. Now, for mature professionals, we need to help them uh, upgrade, and that is why, in collaboration with the Cyberport, we also have other training courses to help middle-class professionals, or rather professionals in general, to um, be equipped with the latest knowledge, including FinTech, RegTech, WealthTech, and well, sorry, um, Secretary, please be succinct. Please be succinct. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Robert Lee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Secretary and representatives of the FSTB for attending the policy briefing. I think that the financial services sector We'll be happy to work with the government in bolstering Hong Kong status as an international financial center. I have two questions. 
Now your paper um, mentions Wealth Management Connect. And from the figures, I learned that it's still uh, in its teething stage. Now for the securities firms, precious stones uh, and uh, metal dealers. There are other financial services providers keen to join the Wealth Management Connect scheme. So may I know from the government what measures are available to promote participation uh, among the uh, non-banks in the sector? Next question about uh, IPO. In fact, in August, the stamp duty for securities markets um, was raised, and this increased cost of transaction. So I want to know from the government what measures are available to prevent a further rise in operating costs and whether um, the government will review the uh, issue of um, eating away competitive edge as a result of raising the stamp duty. Secretary, thank you. Let me first reply to your second question. Frankly, we are contemplating opportunities uh, available to the sector, as you know. In the short run, we're going to roll out retail green bond uh, program, which will allow a wider participation into government in government issued bonds. So, apart from cost, you mentioned, what is more important is uh, how you make profit, and this is what we will work on. The other point is Wealth Management Connect, as you mentioned. From our previous experience, it all hinges on a good start and steady progress. So in terms of uh, credit limits and uh, sales channel participation, these are areas that uh, we will consider. And of course, we need to work out the details with um, our um, uh, um, partner institutions. And we'll share the results with you as soon as they're available. Mr. Lee, any follow-up question? No? All right. Next, Mr. Tam or Hang. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Secretary. I have two questions about pension finance. Hong Kong is an aging society. Pension fin uh, finance is one key aspect of inclusive finance. Hong Kong is a um, renowned international financial center, but I think we're lagging behind in terms of pension finance. Now, my question is on MPF investment. Secretary reported just now that the MPF scheme will be expanded so that uh, central government issued bonds will also be um, available for MPF investment, and I welcome that. To allow a more steady and good investment return by MPF, Will the government uh, develop other um, low-risk channel of investment? Because in terms of guaranteeing low-risk investment, I think the investors would like to have um, a low-risk uh, investment, especially if uh, pension is involved. Now, uh, the bond issuance has been a success. The issue size is uh, 60 billion uh, Hong Kong dollars. It shows that there is a keen demand in this regard. Now, will the government consider expanding the uh, issue size of the retail bond? And meanwhile, 
will more financial products be developed that which are suitable for the for elderly investors to cope with the aging society? Thank you. Uh, Secretary. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tam's question. In terms of reforming the MPF, we are uh, working on several aspects. Well, like Mr. Tam said, we we'll are starting with expanding product offerings. This is really the core issue by affording more choices. Even though uh, there are s uh, seniors, they still prefer choosing what they want. Besides, uh, relaxing to allow investment in mainland securities market will also allow the MPF funds to invest in ACE shares. In just a year, well, uh, the currently I have uh, twenty billion dollars invested in A shares by expanding more choices, but uh, all the, and also uh, launching more products will be a major direction. For example, uh, we hope to introduce more uh, index uh, uh, funds. Another th her aspect working is the cost. We have the management fees and the administration fees. Well, we are spending a uh, four to five billion dollars to send up a centralized platform, so that we can reduce the administration cost. Where, let's say, when it launched by twenty twenty five, the administration cost can be cut by thirty percent. For the one a decade, we can achieve thirty billion dollars in savings due to this EMPF's platform. The third aspect. Oh, uh, we also launch our own initiatives, like Dr. Tan instead like launching a uh, silver bonds, and also soon to be launched, uh, green retail bonds. We'll make sure that we'll uh, cater to retail investors, and when necessary, we all will come up with different initiatives. I'd like to thank Dr. Tan's comments. Next, Mr. Chen Kin Po. Uh, 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 no response. Let me invite the next one, Mr. Chen Chong Nei. Mr. Rock Chen. Just now, I'm glad to hear from um, Secretary Hui that the um, Market Connect scheme has made major inroads. As our markets are getting more connected. I'm worried about investor protection. When there are any uh, default or market misconduct in either side, how do we provide protection for investors from the other side? At any uh, redress and restitution mechanism in place? Second, well, currently we are exploring uh, RMB denominated shares tr trading. I wonder what's the progress. If we're going ahead, and how will we be through the subway trading of the stock connect to uh, trade in uh, Redmond B? I hope that the secretary can tell us. Secretary, let me talk about the first question. On the investor protection, that's a very, very a practical issue. Well, for example, like for Stock Connect, let's say um, the uh, the regulated authority on either side are most familiar in your home turf. The local uh, regulator. Will Will conduct investor education to teach them uh, what can be purchased and what other procedures. Uh, since the uh, wealth manager connect is fairly new and also is catered towards individual investors, therefore they do need more education. As for well, the regulator on both sides are talking to each other all the time. 
and I'll make sure there is timely communication and address any problems. So first, uh, the lo local in regulator shall be responsible for investor education and enforcement, and also through a cross boundary uh, cooperation that we can iron out any problems. As well, Mr. Chen mentioned about uh, the proposed RNB uh, denominated shares trading. Well, we have uh, over uh, like a hundred uh, RMB ETF and small number of stocks and bonds. At the next stage, well, for the southbound trading of the stock connect, we shall allow a trading in uh, RMB. We need to amend some rules and also uh, introduce direct technology. While the investors are currently buying uh, stocks in Hong Kong dollars, they need to convert their RMB to Hong Kong dollar first. If they can buy Hong Kong stocks directly with RMB, we can skip conversion process. Uh, we also, however, we need to upgrade our system first. Well, between the two uh, 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 markets, will there be any arbitrage opportunity? So, th and make sure the uh, prices are aligned. And uh, since we uh, uh, complete the study, I will make sure that I will in uh, brief the members on that. Okay, now it's Mr. Chen Kimbo's turn. Okay, let me turn on the microphone for you. Please turn on your microphone. We can't hear you. Mr. Chan. Chairman, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. First, I'd like to thank the Secretary's briefing. I support all the major policies. For example, uh, reinforce our competitive edge and contribute towards the nation and promote more market access and expand our R&B business. According to Paris 17, talking about the uh, interest after sales center in the Greater Bay Area. Well, we well uh, we, the interest companies hope. That uh, they hope to set it in three locations: Nanshao, Hengqin, and Tianhai, to choose out of these three locations instead of concentrate on one location. I hope that the government can discuss with the mainland. Well, so long that you manage to decide on the cooperation framework, then you let the interest company to choose one out of three locations. And for the risk-based uh, capital regime, hope that in the process you need to be mindful of the small and medium-sized interest companies and allow a sufficient transition period and offer assistance when necessary. And third, on improving our financial infrastructure, the EMPF hopes that it be completed by 2023 and started migration by 2024. The complexity is way higher than anticipated. I hope the government can prepare ahead and hope that you can complete all the testing before lo going live. And instead of rushing it, just to meet the deadline and patching it up afterwards. And for Para 30, I talk about the uh, regulatory regime for a virtual asset service provider. As we all know that it is extremely risky and some of the experts has written to me or is, uh, conveyed me the message that they may worry that uh, since you're proposing regulation, then the public will be safe to engage in virtual assets. Even though you put it under regulation, you are still imposing a lot of constraints. How do you inform the public that this is still a very risky um, product? Secretary. First, and Mr. Chen cared about setting up after sales center in the GBA. Well, th the interest authority have been talking to the mainland regulator. We'll continue with the next step. Well, we'll do anything it could facilitate. Second, on the EMPI platform. Well, on this, we to thank Mr. Chen. He put in a lot of 
work to collect the industry's views. At this stage, this is in a critical stage, and how do we? Uh, of uh, my great trustees onto this platform. Therefore, we will be very prudent to ensure that uh, it will be have a successful launch. And thirdly, on the virtual assets. Well, the next item we're going to discuss this. Let me offer you a preview. Like Mr. Chan said, this is a costly evolving market at the same time uh, some s s see that uh, we should dive into it as somebody so is too risky I must point out that even if we ignore it it is still going to be there why don't we regulate them and also we can invest in investors to, to let them know what the virtual assets is all about and for the next item, we'll discuss it more in detail. Next, Mrs. Virginia Yip. Ms. Yip, can you turn your microphone? Thank you, Chairman. I would like to talk to Mr. Hoi about the listing mechanism. For example, the growth enterprise market. Last year, only one listing in the GM market. Things are going downhill. This SME is going to have a chance to list, and the interest rate is expected to rise. And when the SME cannot get financing through the IPO, they will have a spiraling effect. I'm glad that the Secretary had promised to meet me to discuss this. I hope they can make a public undertaking that you, we promise you will set up a working group to uh, resolve this. First question. And second, on the governance of listed companies, as we all know, are was well, there are just the same pe group of people become independent, non executive director. This is simply impossible, as well having a conflict of interests. Well, to strengthen our reputation at a financial hub, shouldn't the HKEX look into this? Secretary. Thank you, Ms. Yip's question. I'd like to thank her uh, for um, reaching out to the sector. In terms of finance for the SME, this is something we're quite concerned. Well, I hope to uh, offer some relief to their financing challenges, for example, launching the commercial data interchange. For the GEM, we do have work to do. I'm talking to the regulators and the HKEX to uh, listen to more views. To In order to unleash the potential of GEM, we need to uh, uh, rehabilitate investor confidence and also build a whole ecosystem in order to uh, reinvigorate the market. Well, for the next, on this, I would like to uh, discuss with Mrs. Yip. In terms of governance of listed companies, I see this quite a timely issue. We're all talking about the ESG. We want to talk about environment and the social, and now it should be the governance turn. In terms of an IPO, we're quite different from other parts of the world. We used to have a lot of family companies, and now that we have a lot of growth companies, well, it has to do with the share ownership structure and regulations. Well, let's say, uh, shouldn't we uh, examine the listing rules and the code of practice and any room for refinement? There's always room for improvement for corporate governance. We had done a lot on this, for example, uh, their very code of practice and for the, the uh, marketplace and the intermediaries, they do have a duty to ensure compliance. 
and on the ten list, I have at a compliance management personnel on the list. Hong Kong have very strong compliance culture, and our ranking. In terms of financial regulation and compliance level, we do enjoy a very high ranking. However, that doesn't mean we're sitting our hands. Well,、uh, if anything we could work on, I'm glad to do so. Well, I think that、uh, we do have an easy solution.、Uh, the government has a six board rule, so you can limit the number of、uh, NED positions one can take up. Whenever something goes wrong, we usually look for,、um, you know, certain community leaders, and some of these leaders、uh, take up a lot of positions、uh, in the boards of companies. We have a six board rule in the government.、Uh, your time is up, Mrs. Regina Ip. I think your view is very clear, and I understand that、uh, we do have a paper,、uh, a consultation document. And、perhaps after the meeting, you can further liaise with the secretary, and then respond to、uh, his response. Next, Mr. Kichong. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Secretary. I have two questions. First, about an aging population. The IMF earlier raised the same issue in relation to Hong Kong. I think we're all clear. And that、uh, the government has、uh, dished out a lot in fighting the epidemic. Now, have you considered, in the long run, how we can、um, increase、uh, government revenue through taxation,、uh, such as expanding the tax base by introducing, say, capital gains tax? Paragraph twenty-four. That's the second question. That is the.、Um, Green and Sustainable Finance Cross Agency Steering Group. It has、uh, conducted a study on、uh, developing a market trading center in Hong Kong. May I know the progress? There are already、uh, seven carbon emission trading centers in Guangzhou, Shanghai, etc. in the mainland. Will there be any interactions with、uh, Hong Kong? This will affect Hong Kong's position as an international financial center in Asia. And about reindustrialization, by 2025,、uh, with, oh, by 2050, we're supposed to be carbon neutral. Now, may I know whether there is any room、uh, for collaboration with the、uh, carbon trading、uh, exchange? First, on taxation, it is a sensitive topic. It is closely related to everybody in Hong Kong. Now, should there be a new tax type,、uh, there should first of all be ample discussion and a consensus forged in our society. So, careful thinking is required. Second, we do have measures to review the current taxation arrangements. In 2011, 2012, in the budget. We mentioned that we would introduce a progressive、um, tariff for rates. Now this is still、uh, on the table, and we are looking into it、uh, so that uh, those with uh, those who are better off will be able to、uh, pay more and redistribute wealth. Now the third point. Uh, as the member mentioned, is、uh, carbon market, and indeed in the mainland、uh, there are carbon、uh, markets in the region. Now the focus is to create a mass impact, so a more focused approach should be taken to achieve efficiency. Now we have a small economy, we're a city. So、uh, there isn't much room if we just have local carbon trading, but we can leverage on our our advantage. That is just like our listing regime, and the securities market. We have a high quality, credible, and orderly market that can attract investors. So to speak of it.、Um, In another interface, we should make good use of this market opportunity.
investors may find our market smooth, credible, reliable. And this is the direction we're heading in. In other words, we would like to attract foreign investors to take part in our carbon market, but we're still at the preliminary stage. There are technical details to be considered and ironed out. And once we form an initial view and once we have a specific details of consultation, we will seek members' views again. Next, Mr. Chen. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Secretary. I have a number of questions relating to your progress report. Point number four about cross boundary wealth management connect. Secretary also mentioned the scheme. I hope that um, you can include insurance products as early as possible under the Connect scheme. We have mature and large scale insurance products that could meet the uh, wealth management needs. I hope that you can expedite progress. The other point is about paragraph 17 about the after sales service center in um, mainland GBA cities. We've been discussing after sales service centers for over two years. The progress remains slow, however, and I have been taking part in the discussion. I understand that the insurance authority at the moment is liaising with the rather um, with the institutions in the uh, low in the hierarchy. Now, if you want to speed up the establishment of after sales service center, you should speak to the Beijing Insurance Authority directly so that um, they can be our counterpart and that we can speak to them directly about uh, our thoughts. I understand that the Insurance Authority in Hong Kong has been discussing with um, Shenzhen and Guangdong authorities, and I understand that there are some differences. The other point is about the RBC risk-based capital regime in paragraph 18. I understand that uh, many SME insurers are not well prepared for the introduction of RBC. There is also IFRC 17 apart from RBC to be introduced. And uh, it seems that the SME insurers are not yet prepared for its launch. Now, in this event, May I know whether there is any backup plan from the government to um, deal with uh, the smaller insurers? Now, perhaps uh, just pause here and allow Secretary to answer these questions. Secretary, thank you for raising these questions for your sector about uh, insurance products, regulation. Now, first on regulation, earlier, in the legislative timetable we provided to the uh, Legislative Council, we, plan we said we plan to introduce a risk-based capital regime as an enhancement measure so that our standards will be in line with the uh, international regulatory regime. Now, in due course, we are going to table this proposal and seek panel members' views. So perhaps uh, I'll take your suggestion and further discuss this um, legislative proposal at the panel meeting. And about the risk space capital regime, we had three rounds of discussion with the sector. And in the fourth quarter, we also consulted the industry and we had uh, the industry support in general. Of course, we'll consider Mr. Chan's comments as well and see how we can further our discussion in this council later. Now about uh, the scope of wealth, wealth Management Connect WMC and that insurance products should be included. Like I said, we should make a good start and then make a steady progress. And in fact, we will consider a number or, or rather a basket of enhancement measures. We understand the sector's demand and we will continue to improve the uh, scheme. Now, the third point is about the after sales service centers in GBA cities. I also discussed with the insurance authority in Beijing. I understand your point. 
it takes time it will be done step by step so the next step is to maintain liaison with the insurance authority at the uh, G2G level for example we will continue to maintain this liaison and Mr. Chan please do tell us uh, your comments so then we can relate these views uh, Mr. Duncan Chiu thank you Chairman Happy New Year good morning I have two questions and two comments first Regina mentioned Jamboard after the consultation paper issued last time. It has been put on the back burners. 18A, of course, is a new attempt. Uh, but SPAC, I dare not say is uh, innovative. I just hope that uh, you will finish the task. Now, Jamboard has been set up for many years. I hope that we can make uh, good use of it following the mainland uh, model. Now for 18A, I don't see many companies benefiting our economy. The companies uh, don't really have any productive activities in Hong Kong. So I hope that we will consider revamping uh, Gemport. And about virtual assets, I agree with the Secretary that this um, the issue of VA will remain and that will be an alternative investment option. Now, I visited uh, the top 20 VA startups in Hong Kong and frankly, FEX, Ember, the largest uh, startups are now leaving Hong Kong and I suppose uh, Secretary know that as well. We, we uh, agree that uh, we should target institutional investors, not retail. But for uh, retail, settlements, etc., these are uh, major opportunities with low risks. And it also shows our knowledge of virtual asset. And this will form the basis of a licensing regime. This will help retain companies. But at the moment, we don't see many VA companies staying behind. What I'm uh, worried uh, is that only the smaller um, unlicensed VA dealers will remain. This will not be beneficial. Now, for the eight general partners appointed, I hope that uh, you will uphold the rule of uh, investing in projects with the Hong Kong Nexus in the Hong Kong growth portfolio. I hope that they will truly invest in Hong Kong instead of just um, purchasing uh, funds. Now, I think, well, why don't you allow Secretary to answer your questions first? I don't think he has time to answer your questions anyway. I, I hope that uh, uh, job opportunities can be provided. Secretary, in the interest of time, let me briefly respond about Jam Board. Uh, along with Mrs. Regina Ip's point, I will um, con we will review the situation and consider the uh, market and the GBA opportunities. Now, about virtual assets, uh, this will be discussed in the next item. Well, you mentioned the companies leaving, but I talked to some providers as well. I think uh, some of them would like to have certainty, on the other hand. So if we take things step by step and uh, enact legislation, this will provide a clear backing for them to start the business uh, as it provides certainty. So from this perspective, a uh, legal regime would be beneficial. Now for the third point you mentioned, uh, when we choose general partners, uh, this will be our focus. Thank you. Next, Mr. Long Chi Wing. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to refer to paragraph 35, the EMPF platform. It has a major connection with the abolition of the MPF offsetting arrangement. According to the paper, the user-oriented platform will start by the end of 2022 at the earliest. By then, the design will have been completed and then 
starting from April 2023 and 2024, in a period of about 20 months, trustees will be able to migrate to the new platform. Now, during this 20-month transitional period, when a trustee has migrated to the new platform, does it mean that it will start its operation and make use of the data available? Or is it that the trustees and members will just continue to use its own platform and system in terms of data processing. The other point is that, according to the paper, full implementation will take place in around 2025, and by then, uh, only by then will we be able to um, abolish the MPF offsetting arrangement. May I know the timetable? Is it in the beginning, middle, or the end of 2025? Can we have more information, please? Oh, Secretary, I'll uh, let uh, the Permanent Secretary Yan to answer the question. We are aggressively taking forward the construction of the EMPA platform, and other members mentioned that uh, we must show the system is uh, safe and sound before going live. In terms of our design and testing, we're working full steam and also urge the contractor to start uh, talking uh, talking to stakeholders like employers and employees to test the application and user interface. For the transition period that will offer a phased migration of trustees in order uh, to migrate trustees in batches. For the 14 trustees, well, they might have their own timetable of migrating to EMPF. However, once they decide to, uh, to migrate, they should run their system on the EMPF platform. That's quite clear. Well, after migrating to EMPF, so. Uh, they will not sum the process to run on their own system while some run on the EMPF system. We expect that when they migrate to the EMPF platform, all the business process will operate from there. So let's say by uh, April 2023 that the migration will start. And hopefully by early 2025 that there will be the full implemented. That's quite a time tight timetable. Mr. Liang, second question. For the offsetting of the MPF, uh, there is a 32 billion financial arrangements. Will that be a one-off funding or will they be give dispersed in stages? Secretary, quick answer. But just now, the secretary explained that after launching the EMPF, we expect there will be a reduction in charges. Well, uh, we expect there will be instant thirty percent savings. And over time, that we expect that it achieved the intended payoff. Of course, we try to squeeze more savings from there. Well, the government. Had chipped in about four point nine billion, and we will not recoup it from the users, which will benefit both the employees and the employees. And finally, Mr. Bill Tang. Thank you, Chairman. Three questions for me. Okay, let me declare. I am a not. Independent on executive director of the MPFA. Well, my questions are related to the MPF. For the upcoming uh, amendment exercise, that you uh, 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 relax the proportion on investment on uh, mainland financial institutions and policy banks. Well, of, uh, well, it will bring actual returns and also 
decolonization of finance. Has the government comprehensively reviewed that for the assets under its management of any unnecessary hurdles and restrictions without the amendment the MPF schemes can only invest 10% into the Chinese sovereign bonds. Upon the amendment, this restriction will be lifted. It's ridiculous that we have some f funds that devote all the, their uh, assets on U.S. government bonds. Any government, any assets managed by public organizations have imposed such ridiculous restrictions. And can we take a step further? Like Dr. Tan said, well, uh, employees always prefer stable returns. Well, for example, this let's say uh, uh, the government and uh, uh, CPF can achieve four point five percent. However, this the private MPF operator cannot offer a guaranteed returns. Now that we are uh, allowing in more investment into the Chinese sovereign bonds, can the ch Chinese or our institutions can uh, launch bonds of a guaranteed return nature that will beat inflation, that the social insurance of Shenzhen can achieve a 7 to 8% annual return. Why can't we match that? Um, Ms. Tang, please stop. Let Secretary answer the first and second question first. Let me clarify. And well, uh, Mr. Tan provided a lot of feedback when serving the MPFA. For each MPF fund, can allocate a thirty percent onto the uh, bonds from this as the exempt authority. And it can and must take part in no less than six times of issuance. In terms of reforming the MPF, in my response to Dr. Tan, we work on seven areas. First, we're expanding offerings. Second, we're cutting the cost. While the MPF is a major cost cutting drive. In terms of choices, well, uh, the MPF has its own committee to. Consider what kind of products should be included. Like Mr. Chang says, some of the green or ESG related products. Well, we will continue to look for refinements and please be assured that each authority in its own ambit will uh, need to uh, uh, refine and keep up with the times. Well, let's, for example, uh, by moving into A shares and also moving into the bond market, for uh, sovereign bonds and so on, the direction is clear. We need to consider how do we expand our product and reach our portfolio. Besides offering more choice to the public, we're also offering products of different returns. And, for example, uh, how do we relax the MBF restrictions on certain investment gradually? So that our workers are given more choices. You can't ask another question. Uh, you overran. And f secretary, one quick question for me. And so we all know, and the people also mentioned that the SFC HKEX and the uh, HKMA have formed a working group. And are currently conducting feasibility on trading Hong Kong stocks using RMB. When the report will be released? When you release the report, uh, will you be able to offer us a timetable? Yes, it will happen. Well, currently we are still drafting the feasibility report. Therefore, I can't offer you a timetable. Well, uh, we we need to need to coordinate with the mainland. While well, the mainland investors are connected to the mainland system before investing in Hong Kong stocks, before we need to uh, tweak our systems. We have a concrete time table. We'll come back to the panel. 
just that a lot of members ask quite some salient questions on different areas due to time constraints you may not able to offer detailed reply on each I hope that you can either offer a written response or sit down with them at a later date for example on the uh, bonds market and just now Mr. Bill Tang mentioned that how to offer the best returns to the Hong Kong public what well, we proposed earlier that whether we can make the bond market available to retail investors on currently unless you are institutional investor you can't buy any bonds if for the uh, if the Hong Kong government uh, issue bonds well that would be quite a guaranteed product if it only limited to institutional investors a lot of people may see that is something we can improve for example Singapore government has now allowed retail investors and well would you like to respond on this uh, which chairman you're right with something we're looking to for example uh, we are we're launching the green retail bonds well we're riding on the way for carbon neutrality I uh, hope that this uh, green concept can raise into the public consciousness thank you secretary and that's the end of this item uh, we have overrun by over 20 minutes Therefore, we need to speed up. May I remind members that each member can only have four minutes for Q&A. If your question runs till three minutes, then the secretary cannot reply adequately. I, well, it's actually difficult uh, to carry on the meeting without asking questions at one go and now let's move on to the second item anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing amend bill 2022 and we first invite the secretary to briefly talk about this topic thank you chair As you know, Hong Kong has been a member of the Financial Action Task Force, or FedEx, since 1991. And then we underwent a mutual evaluation of our anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, or AML-CTF regime, from 2018-2019. <laughs> The Mutual Evaluation Report, or MER, on Hong Kong, published in September 2019, concludes that Hong Kong has a strong legal foundation and effective system for combating money laundering or terrorist financing. The report also sets out recommendations on areas to improve. This legislative exercise is a response to FedEx's recommendations in the MER and updated standards introduced after 2019 with a view to fulfilling Hong Kong's obligations as a member of FedEx and improve our regulatory regime. We propose to amend the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorist Financing Ordinance, AMLO, CAP 615, to introduce a licensing regime for virtual asset service providers, or VASPs, and a registration regime for dealers in precious metals and stones, TPMS, which will impose statutory AMF CTF obligations on these two sectors. We'll also take this opportunity to address a number of miscellaneous issues under AMLO, which have been identified in the MER or other FedEx contexts. We completed a public consultation last year. Overall speaking, there is broad support for the government to strengthen Hong Kong's AMF CTF system, having regard to international standards, in keeping with our status as an international financial center. A majority of the respondents indicated agreement with the overall direction and principles, as well as the broad framework of the legislative proposals. And I'd like to supplement on another point. And in fact, in the last agenda item, many members mentioned virtual assets. 
Now, this has been developing rapidly in recent years, and there are divergent views in the community on its regulation. Some believe there should be tougher regulations, while others believe there should be sufficient room for the sector to develop. As an international financial center, we must strike a proper balance. And financial regulators have been adopting different measures. In 2019, the Securities and Futures Commission established a voluntary opt-in regime for platforms offering trading of securities type virtual assets. The SFC and Hong Kong MA have been issuing guidelines to regulated institutions for investor protection and minimizing money laundering risks. In January this year, the Hong Kong MA issued a discussion paper on crypto assets and stable coins, setting out this thinking on the regulatory approach for crypto assets, particularly stable coins, and seeking feedback from the public and the stakeholders. To sum up, Hong Kong is an open, reliable, and competitive place for investment and business. To safeguard Hong Kong's status as an international financial center, the government must set up an AML CTF regime, which is in line with international standards and which is effective. This regime will be conducive to preventing unlawful activities, boosting the confidence of investors and international institutions in Hong Kong as a clean and safe place for business, thereby enhancing Hong Kong's competitiveness. We hope to take today's opportunity to explain the background of this legislative amendment proposal and details of the regulatory regime to help members understand the necessity of this legislative amendment exercise. Subject to members' views, our goal is to submit the bill to the Chief Executive in Council for consideration. Details of the proposal are set out in the paper. So in the interest of time, I'll stop here and we welcome views from members. Thank you, Secretary. We have Mr. Bill Tang, Mr. Dr. Wong Yunshan, Mr. Tan Yue Hung, um, Mr. Ronak Chen, Mr. Rock Chen, um, Mr. Ro uh, Robert Lee, and Mr. Chang Kin Paul. Any other members who would like to speak? If not, I'll draw a line here. Three minutes, questions and answers included. We start with Mr. Bill Tang. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be brief this time first. Of course, the background of the bill is to prevent uh, money laundering and terrorist financing. Now, for members here who are concerned about uh, people's livelihood, we're concerned about consumers' interests and uh, the possible um, mislead. Um, you know, um, consumers being misled, and in fact, uh, we see different practices adopted online, and uh, they really penetrate into the lives of people. Um, many people learn about these products online. I want to make sure there is a mechanism to protect consumers in these cases of deception and fraud. On the other hand, I understand that uh, the uh, global tech giants also issued crypto assets. Will this bill cover such uh, activities? Secretary. Thank you. As Mr. Tang said, uh, crypto uh, virtual assets have become a trend in recent years, and we've seen advertisements even um, in MTR stations, and that is the background and the reason for this amendment bill. After regulation, um, a dealer must uh, get a license before it is allowed to post advertisements and promote these products. Unlicensed VASP will be prevented from promoting um, uh, VA-related activities in Hong Kong or elsewhere, and uh, the uh, authority will closely monitor uh, the situation, including whether the promotional materials are in line with the licensing condition. And about uh, regulated activities, we regulate the uh, VASP, uh, in other words, despite uh, calling, um, despite uh, virtual assets, the name virtual assets, uh, some activities are intertwined with other financial activities. And that is why VA exchanges should be regulated. 
because the activities um, f of the exchanges fall into the scope of our regulation. What about uh, tech giants like Facebook? If it issues a virtual asset, uh, crypto coins, would it, will we be able to regulate it? If it falls within the definition of uh, VA exchange, then yes, it is caught by this bill. We regulate the activities of the VA exchange. Say if it provides a platform for uh, VA trading, then it is uh, subject to our regulation. In terms of, say, responsible person, asset management, and other matters, they are subject to our regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, because uh, there is great variety in terms of VAs. Well, Secretary, I think you've answered his question. For the details, for other details, um, please uh, uh, speak to Mr. Tang afterwards. Dr. Wong Yunshan. Thank you, Chair, Secretary. Well, of course, I support this uh, proposed bill to bring ourselves in line with international AML CTF standards. Now, I'm concerned about uh, the latest development for tangible assets such as property assets. Sometimes they may support VA activities. In SDX in Switzerland or SDAX in Singapore, they have exchanges allowing virtual assets trading backed by uh, tangible assets. So, Secretary, Will there be a strategy um, to cope with uh, VA back or, or tangible asset backed VAs in Germany? I understand that um, they have the relevant development and there are strategies to support um, VA to reap its benefit. For example, with the use of blockchain um, technology, users will be able to get um, risk ex exposure. Now, for now, once the uh, technology is mature, will we be able to improve uh, the uh, regime to allow a wider participation by investors? Let me first explain the logic of the regulatory regime. And perhaps uh, while doing so, I can answer Dr. Wong's question as well. In terms of the value chain, you will consider, uh, for example, a number of matters such as AML. But in Hong Kong, our focus is on VA exchange. We'd like to have this regulatory handle so that the SFC uh, can take up this task of regulation. Now, like Dr. Wong said, this is involving, um, such as in Germany, in Switzerland, uh, we continue to see new types of virtual assets. And it is difficult to define the types of assets uh, to be regulated. And that is why we need to take a regulatory perspective. In this constantly evolving market landscape, we need to draw a line um, to and ring fancy market to make sure that our financial infrastructure will not be affected by these um, activities. So like you mentioned, if trading is involved, uh, such as the VA exchange, um, as we mentioned in our proposed bill, this will be subject to our regulation. Now, you mentioned professional investors and whether we should allow wider participation. Now, I think that we should closely monitor the market as it is constantly evolving. And in fact, uh, it's an open end question because, like Dr. Wong said, we continue to see new types of VA. And therefore, the bill empowers uh, the secretary, that is myself, to consider whether um, uh, an asset could be regarded as a VA. So it sets out the framework and allow us flexibility to include other VAs uh, in the future, subject to market development. It's a dynamic process. Next, uh, Dr. Tan Yue Heng. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Secretary. I am fully in support of regulating VA activities. I have a number of questions. 
regarding private VA exchange that is uh, providing a platform for buyers and sellers of VA. This will be regulated. What about trading of VA outside of this exchange? It will not be regulated under this bill. In other words, um, there will be some risks uh, left unregulated. So the question is about uh, VA trading outside of the VA exchange. The other point is that under the proposed licensing regime, all directors will be subject to the FFC's vetting as responsible person. Now, does it what? Isn't it uh, appropriate to impose a high level of requirement? Because when VA is involved, at least training um, should be a mandatory requirement to make sure that um, the director will have the necessary um, knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Let me first answer the second question, the, the, the first question. Now, about VA exchange, which is a subject of this regulation, and about trading outside the exchange, in the along the value chain of VA, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, there are more activities relating to VA exchanges. Second, although they are of a smaller scale, many of these activities are carried out via uh, certain financial institutions. In other words, in the current legislative framework, we are already able to um, incorporate uh, these activities. That is why we start this bill with uh, v regulating VA exchange. For, uh, for activities uh, that involve uh, other financial institutions, it's not a subject of this bill. Now, the other point is, like I said, if there are new types of VAs in the future, if it falls within the definition of expressing value digitally, um, it can be captured in the future. Third point about compliance requirements and uh, tech professionals, uh, I'll defer to uh, my colleague. Paul Sloan to take, the, take this question. Uh, I'm sorry, Julia will answer the second question about talents. No, I, I think time's up. We, we don't have time. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Ronick Chan. I have a number of questions. First, Secretary just now mentioned that the uh, Hong Kong MA has issued a discussion paper on regulating stable coins. And uh, this bill provides that the SFC will be the uh, licensing authority. Is it that one regulates trading, the other regulates licenses? And for the miscellaneous uh, uh, amendments, I understand that um, there is also a technical, um, uh, you know, amendment of the technical definition of politically exposed person. Does it mean that this will apply to um, other financial institutions? Now, the other question is that uh, under what scenario will you open um, the market to uh, non-professional investments? You say that this is only an initial definition. Uh, will there be a time frame? First, on the definition of the virtual asset, what's this uh, amendment says all about? Well. What the are exempting the uh, central bank digital currency? The HKMA has conducted consultation that from the well on the payment perspective. Well, if the way is used for payment and uh, their position on regulation, the consultation just started, and we welcome everyone their submissions. However, we talk. We're really targeting the VA exchanges, which is different from the function. And for the uh, timetable, well, it's hard to spell out a timeline 
when the market is still evolving? Well, earlier I talked to quite a few institutions. For example, the SFC. A lot of the uh, regulators and market participants crave for a s certainty. Even it's limited to um, professional investors. This is still good news, so that they get a clear idea where we are heading. And third question, on the politically exposed persons, PEP. Well, currently we are having a nation. A nation, national basis, and while we are putting in a jurisdiction basis. Next, Mr. Rock Chen. And thank you, Chair. I hope that the Secretary can clarify two areas. On paragraph 13, the paper mentioned that you will license the VA exchanges. However, for those who are licensed a corporation in the opt in regime, they will be exempted. We have two different types of platforms. The uh, type regulations and the law applicable to them will be the same. The paper proposes that this time we are licensing the VA exchanges, but did not mention that the intermediaries and the Intermediate practitioners are covered in this exercise. It seems that they are not regulated from my reading. Which is VA is like trading securities. The SFC issued nine type of licenses. Would you consider taking a gradual approach in expanding the uh, regulated activities to regulate the intermediaries and their practitioners? Secretary, well, the SFC recently issued some guidelines. I'll let Mr. Liang to uh, elaborate. Thank you, Mr. Chen. This question. So the first question. We already have this opt-in regime in place, and after the enactment of AMO and LO amendments, that the two sets of Regulation are essentially the same. The current opt in regime license operation, we shall also apply them to the uh, upcoming bill. For these VA exchanges on, let's say, network security on anti money laundering. And conflict of interest, we are aligning the requirements. I believe that for the same type of business, they do entail the same risk and be subject to the same requirement. For the second question, for the intermediaries, are they regulated? That's quite important. We notice the intermediaries, such as banks and brokerage firms, and And they notice the investors are interested in virtual assets or virtual funds and other kind of products. We issued a joint circular with the HKMA. If they decided to engage in such uh, intermediate work, uh, what is the applicable code of practice? Um, most of the virtual funds or products, we require them they're only available to professional investors, and this investor uh, needs to conduct a KYC and demonstrate their own product knowledge and also uh, submit a risk disclosure before being allowed to invest. The overall direction is to protect investors and make sure they know about their risk when purchasing. Next, Mr. Robert Lee. Thank you, Chair. Secretary, well, on virtual assets, the industry are hoping for a regulation regime. If these uh, transactions are unregulated, they will still take place anyway with a regulation regime that will offer 
more market order and better investor protection. Just one piece of advice. You need to step up the publicity and education. Even though you're just limiting to professional investors for now, well, in the future, there will be a lot of unlicensed via exchanges. We should make the public aware of this. And for the uh, dealers in precious metals and stones, DPMS, you need to uh, educate about this sector. Well, take the precious metals, for example, like uh, the jewelers and the gold traders and the uh, banking institutions. The paper mentioned that for the FIs already regulated, you offer exemption. Will this just be temporary? Let's say the, uh, some of the subsidiaries are holding SFC licenses, or let's say they are members of the gold and silver exchanges, and so on. Will the exemptions apply to individuals? subsidiary or it applied to the entire group and uh, Mr. Wu according to the draft bill in terms of exemption is some of the banks and licensed corporations and insurance companies are regulated by the SFC laws they can apply for exemption and they would not need to be licensed under the proposed new regime. My question is, let's say, let's say for a banking group, let's say they do have a subsidiary trading in um, precious metals. As a group subsidiary, that each of the subsidiary need to uh, meet to requirements or they can they enjoy exemption at a wider group level I wonder if you get my question it all depends on the corporate structure assuming that the subsidiaries main line of business well first uh, it must be the is the principal business to engage in the trading of precious metals, and this business is regulated by the SFOs. Then it will not. Then it will be exempt at this time. Well, with the way we're drafting this bill, if they already are regulated by a certain legislation, that it will enjoy exemption. Next, Mr. Chen Kinpo. Thank you, Chair. I am definitely supporting this to control money laundering and hope to help to uh, enhance the Hong Kong's development in virtual assets at the same time offer investor protection. I believe that uh, we can just offer more education and go with the flow if there is seeing uh, new uh, scams then the SFC or the SFCB must uh, come out and advise the public. Well, in terms of protecting the consumers or investors, how do you ensure that these VA operators can able to meet their obligations? Well, let's say it require them to hold an asset in a certain way. Well, this happens at insurance companies. Well, uh, sometimes the asset will be ring fenced in Hong Kong to ensure the capital adequacy. I wonder if you can introduce this to the VA operators as well. Secretary. Well, considering the risks with the VA assets is way higher than the conventional financial assets, that's why we're introducing regulatory requirements asking the VA service operators in terms of managing and uh, and, and and customer assets do need to purchase insurance. For example, uh, the virtual assets hold on, on, online, and also uh, the risk of uh, holding customers' assets offline. Well, uh, buying insurance is one thing, but I wonder 
uh, the people did uh, is it really insurable and whether the policy will be expensive well we need to utilize all kinds of like regulatory tools well make sure that them um there will be enough money to uh, pay for the creditors under the opt-in regime uh, this requirement is already in place we haven't heard any difficulty in purchase insurance let miss learn to supplement Well, for the class assets, protection is similar to that in financial institutions. Let's say if they check up the customer's money or the virtual asset, they need to be as segregated. They cannot mix it with their own assets. By then, even if the exchange goes bankrupt, then the segregated assets can still be protected. Next, Mr. Tommy Chung. Please turn the microphone. Well, I'm old and hard of hearing. Can you hear me? A lot of colleagues have asked the same question. Reading your paper, I support this proposal. There's there's no other way. I wonder if this really falls under your brew. Reading from the title and the paper, we're talking about anti money laundering and counter terrorist financing. Let's say me, Tommy Chung, decide to want to raise capital on my webpage asking people to donate into my account to let's say let's say I would like to use the proceeds to engage in terrorism activities at home or abroad what can you do is there any way that you can regulate I see a lot of donate appeals uh, to help to pay the legal costs and so on however nobody monitor the spending and well uh, the you are well, using this uh, bank accounts asking people to donate to a foreign bank account, which then the money will be funneled to a local a banking account. Is your department or the police uh, uh, monitoring this kind of uh, donation drive or claiming, let's say, to help to defray the legal costs or is the money used to pay for making petrol bombs? Now that you this amendment bill, can you expand it to? include the use of Hong Kong banking accounts or any other platforms which um, would empower you to examine or what and also ask them to file the taxes or require them to submit the audit report well and um, Mr. Chen has been very forward-looking well, this bill only target mostly via exchanges. That issue you raised. Well, what? Well, we're talking about the uh, anti money laundering. We have uh, the police and the custom access with us again. This is a cross departmental endeavor. Well, I I would say that Mr. Chang was required referring to crowd uh, funding. We are currently undertaking a study to see anything we should refine. Which does not have a direct correlation with the agenda item. However, we are looking into the crowdfunding phenomenon. Secretary, everyone in Hong Kong are quite concerned on how to um, safeguard national security and security of the SAR. In the past, a lot of people have used various ways to raise money or appeal to donations uh, in, to provide money to uh, subvert 
the country or the, our institutions. A lot of people depositing huge amounts into bank account. How now? Right now, the nation comes in dollars and cents, and they break up the amount when sending out. In terms of regulation, the Hong Kong government has been quite strict on this. How with the fragmentation of donation and expenditure? Is there any way that we can help the Hong Kong banking sector and the advice? They are in a difficult spot. And they only act on government's orders. Well, money laundering is one thing in a commercial world. However, recently we heard that a money laundering is used to plan for terrorist activities. Can the secretary tell us on this issue what can you do so that uh, Hong Kong can prevent uh, money laundering and uh, layering out? Thank you, Chairman, for concern over this topic. This is an important aspect of our status as an international financial center. Now, may I quote uh, from our report card, the FedEx Financial Action Task Force acknowledges our work. In September 2019, the mutual evaluation report published acknowledged our legal regime for combating money laundering and terrorist financing. So I would say that uh, we did get an A in our report card, but it doesn't mean that uh, we should relax our efforts and that accounts for this legislative proposal. Now, uh, about uh, the issue you raised, uh, this is something we look into on a continuous basis uh, it with with a view to bolstering our status as an international financial center. That wraps up the item. Welcome. Um, I thank uh, Secretary once again for attending, and I thank your other representatives as well. Our next item is briefing on the work of the Hong Kong MA. So let me welcome representatives from the Hong Kong MA, and I will now invite Mr. Eddie Yu, Chief Executive, to uh, give us a briefing. You have given us a really thick stack of papers, so no need to go through each and every page. Perhaps, Addy, you can just give us some salient points in your presentation. CE. Thank you, Chairman. We'll try to be brief. Myself and the Deputy Chief Executives will brief you on the work of the HAMA and uh, our assessment of the financial landscape at the moment. Now, our main functions are to maintain currency stability, to promote the integrity and stability of the financial system, and to maintain Hong Kong status as an IFC and manage the exchange fund. We report to the panel a few times a year on our work. Now, about the global economic growth forecast, well, perhaps I will skip this slide. Uh, the next slide. This year, what affects the global market is the uh, inflation situation in the United States and the pace of uh, interest hike. As you can see in the right-hand side chart, in They've become hawkish since the beginning of this year, as the upward trend is anticipated. In early March, according to their statement, the uh, asset purchase program will come to an end. In other words, they was they may they have the prerequisite to start an interest hike starting March this year. And according to this chart, uh, there will be uh, interest hikes uh, three to six times within the year. Now, as the pace of interest hike picks up. Now for the blue line here is uh, S&P 500. And 
that which represents the uh, stock market in the U.S. They've been um, on an upward trend for two years. So, with the interest rates rising, it's questionable whether um, there'll be more market fluctuations. Now, in the low interest rate environment, in the past two years, there have been capital inflows into um, Asian emerging markets. Now, the other concern, therefore, is whether the U.S. interest hike may cause a capital outflow in Asia. Now, for the global economy, the pandemic um, is dealing a great blow to the global economy, of course. Now, if the pandemic continues in some emerging markets with low vaccination rate, inevitably, there will be a stronger impact. Vaccination rate is, after all, a major factor for economic recovery. So uh, I'd like to appeal to especially the elderly population in Hong Kong to get vaccinated so that we can boost the vaccination rate. Now for this chart on the left hand side, as far as the mainland economy is concerned, after the uh, pace of growth has slowed down last year, we have uh, remained stable. Now, there is uh, somewhat a downward economic pressure due to the ongoing pandemic. According to the mainland authorities, the focus of this year's economic growth is to stabilize the economy. And that is why in terms of the fiscal policy and uh, currency policy, a more flexible approach, um, uh, or rather a more prudent approach will be taken to support the economy. As far as Hong Kong is concerned, the major um, factor, of course, is the epidemic. Last year, we recorded uh, an economic growth of 6.4%. In terms of export of goods and private consumption uh, spending, the situation remained robust. But in the first half of this year, uh, we expect to be affected by the pandemic. For the chart on the right-hand side, you will see that uh, the SMEs will be subject to greater pressure in the first quarter, especially. Inflation. Well, um, the uh, imported uh, prices and inflation presents um, uh, a major factor, but then inflation remains uh, moderate. And then for the financial markets in Hong Kong, first of all, for Hong Kong dollar market in the past two years, the uh, exchange rate remains at uh, a stable level at about 7.79. But if the interest spread continues to um, widen, you will see that the uh, Hong Kong dollar exchange rate will uh, gradually uh, inch towards 7.85. Now, if Hong Kong dollar is on the weak side, especially, um, well, and this is only to be expected in a normal situation, especially after US interest hike, this will be the trend. As for the total deposit uh, growth, uh, last year we recorded a 4.6% growth which is quite good. For the property market, this squarish chart shows you the uh, situation last year. The property prices rose by 3% on the whole. In the beginning of this year, the prices somewhat eased, um, albeit on a stable level. In the fourth quarter, the transaction volume also remained stable. In the first quarter of this year, we recorded a reduction in transaction volume because of the pandemic. So all in all, in the coming year, there are three major factors affecting our financial system. First, the pandemic affecting the local economy as well as the global economy. The second factor is a U.S. interest hike. Depending on this pace, there may be adjustments or corrections in the capital markets, and there may be capital outflows from emerging markets. The third factor is geopolitics, especially the Ukraine uh, situation. There may be an expected developments causing uh, market fluctuations. Still, we are resilient and 
we have we are highly liquid and uh, even if there is unexpected capital flow, we will be resilient enough to cope with it. I'll defer to Arthur to briefly brief you the work of the HKMA. Uh, first on the banking sector, about credit growth and asset quality in 2021 for the whole year. Credit growth uh, recorded was 3.8% for the whole year, slightly higher than the previous year. The pandemic continues to affect the economy, and with a credit growth of 3.8%, I would say that uh, the uh, situation is uh, satisfactory, and the banking sector has continued to support the real economy. You may be concerned whether the asset quality has deteriorated. Around third quarter last year, the, there was a change in terms of uh, asset uh, quality. And classified loan ratio decreased slightly by 0.81%. As for the classified loan ratio um, targeting mainland investors, um, the uh, ratio was 0.77%. In the fourth quarter, with emergence of Omicron variant and pressure on the global supply chain, some mainland-related loans, especially high, highly leveraged um, mainland property-related uh, loans, uh, you will expect an increase in this uh, ratio because of a higher pressure. However, we do have a robust banking uh, sector in Hong Kong with high liquidity. So even if there is an increase in this ratio, the, we are still resilient. And we are now at the ratio 0.81%. And even if it edges up uh, slightly, comparing to the banking sector's uh, classified uh, loan ratios around the world, I would say that the asset quality of the banking sector remains good. Now, you may be concerned about support uh, uh, for SMEs uh, in the current pandemic. About a year or so ago, we um, launched the pre-approved principal payment holiday scheme. At first, uh, 16 eligible enterprises uh, used this scheme, and then the take-up rate gradually lowered to 3% recently. And we further extended the scheme last year to um, the end of April this year, and we've agreed that by this time, there we may need to gradually, um, with put an end to the uh, scheme. But by then, the Omicron variant had not emerged. We will keep in view the latest situation and further discuss with the sector on um, the proper arrangement. Most importantly, we should be able to continue to support SMEs and strike a proper balance um, between that and uh, the banking sector. Now, legislative work for this year, basically, we're going to amend certain subsidiary legislation. They will be tabled into the council for approval. Within this year, we should amend the relevant items of subsidiary legislation to uh, implement the final reform package of Basel III by June 2023. In other words, we have a number of amendments to the subsidiary legislation. And uh, in the interest of time, I will skip them. And if you're interested, you can uh, ask me questions relating to these. Uh, next, I will defer to my colleague to speak on uh, other matters. In terms of market development, one important area is to promote the growth of uh, or development of the offshore RMB business. And I'm happy to report that uh, in the past period, we have recorded significant growth in the uh, renminbi uh, offshore business. Now, you can look at the table in terms of renminbi deposits and dim sum bonds. Uh, double digit growth uh, have been recorded. It shows the interest of global investors in renminbi denominated assets, especially when more and more indices uh, have been uh, included. Now, in terms of offshore renminbi bond last year, we recorded significant development. In terms of quality, there was a growth of um, 
90%. We are seeing a greater variety of products as well. Last year, the Shenzhen Municipal Government for the first time issued renminbi bonds in Hong Kong. And uh, we also have green bonds issued in Hong Kong. This um, helps deepen and widen our market. In terms of mutual market access, we um, well, last year was a fruitful year. Uh, we continue to see vibrant activities uh, under the Stock Connect southbound and northbound trading and double digit growth year on year have been recorded. And last year, we launched the uh, southbound trading under Bond Connect and cross boundary wealth management connect. And just like other mutual market connect schemes, well, uh, both sides regulators hope that the investors and the market participants are familiar with the operations and the respective market environment to steadily develop these two connect schemes. At the next step, we'll work with the sector on the promotion and investor education. We'll also uh, listen from the industry feedback to expand these schemes. For example, on expanding the eligibility of eligible products and the class of eligible investors. On green finance, that well, uh, it was, was quite a vibrant scene at the bond market that the government decided to regularize the government green bond program and last October managed to launch $4 billion of uh, green bonds of different variety and denominations. We're now currently launching, preparing the launching of the retail green bonds. And other corporations also uh, each shoot a lot of green bonds in Hong Kong. And last year, the, the issue of green bonds and green loans has jumped by fourfold. And in order to attract green finance activities, and last May, the government launched that the Green and Sustainable Finance uh, Subsidy Scheme will subsidize some of the costs of the bond issuance and external review. This scheme is quite what rate received. In the nine months since launch, over 50 entities managed to issue green bonds in Hong Kong. And next, I would like to talk about crypto assets and stable coins. And last month, the HKME issued a discussion paper on crypto assets and stable coins and setting out our position on regulation and payment related stable coins and inviting views from the industry and the public. And globally, this is a huge topic of concern. Therefore, we shall monitor the other regulators recommendations before deciding on the future direction and the regulatory framework. We try to balance between financial innovation and investor protection. When we have a concrete legislative proposal, we will come back to the panel. And next, I'll hand over to Howard Lee, Deputy Chief Executive. Well, I'll talk about the financial infrastructure. Well, I want to talk about the few part of the financial infrastructure. The banks are quite concerned about the faster payment system. And there are also other kind of industry use tools. Well, uh, they're like the blood vessels in a financial system. They must be visible. However, they are quite crucial in uh, running our financial system. I will not go into detail. And now I'll talk about the FinTech. Well, uh, we'll talk about the latest development. In the previous item, members have expressed a lot of concern on FinTech. Well, after we set up the FinTech uh, uh, facilitation office, and all together we've launched a 20 button initiatives. Let me highlight a few key ones. For example, uh, the e Hong Kong dollar, the central bank digital currency, and well, at the wholesale level, we're working with the uh, Bank of International Settlement and multiple central banks 
on conducting a pilot trial. Another infrastructure is the uh, commercial data interchange, which allowed the companies uh, to uh, collate the data scattered on different platforms. For example, uh, that would help them to obtain more credit information, thus better loan terms. And this will now uh, having a pilot launch hopefully within this year. And uh, and with China, we hope to launch the FinTech Supervisory Sandbox. Well, some of the measures that we can dovetail with some of the uh, pilot schemes in order to help the corporations in launching their FinTech programs. While the Hong Kong FinTech Week is organized every year, and each year we, org in, we attract a lot of participants. Next, the Exchange Fund Investment Performance. Okay, some background. The Exchange Fund had a statutory purpose listed out here that is to affect the exchange value of the Hong Kong currency and on this premises to develop uh, the Hong Kong as a financial hub. Very often, the some part of the exchange fund can not be used freely as has been restricted by the law. And the purpose also shaped our investment aim. First is to protect the capital as to ensure there is sufficient liquidity when engaging in any type of investment. Therefore, it's quite different from other investment funds. The next two slides will talk about the fixed, the government bonds market and the stock market performance. And while this is the investment uh, performance in 2021 that for well bonds um, made very little returns as it noticed recorded a short price drop and while other markets have risen the Hong Kong uh, has stocks fared not so well and the overall investment performance the biggest contribution came from other investments well, that is the Hong Kong growth portfolio, which achieve good returns. Altogether, we achieve a hundred seventy billion dollars in returns, and this has been announced earlier. Of the thirty-four point four billion dollars, we ate. This is what we're able to uh, provide to the financial secretary's office, uh, our fee payment to the fiscal reserve. Well, uh, well, this is the investment return over the years. We always manage to beat inflation. Next, the Hong Kong Mortgage Corporation. Well, uh, it provides mortgage insurance for home buyers. Well, currently, uh, most homeowners are able to uh, get a loan at 6 to 70 percent. It really depends on the uh, price of their home. They can uh, get a 90 up to 90 percent of their house value. And we work with the government to launch the SME financing guarantee scheme. We're benefiting tens of thousands of small and medium on enterprises to sustain their uh, uh, capital needs. And last year, we launched the 100% personal loan guarantee scheme. It was, as some people are temporary unemployed, they can borrow some money to tie them through the tough periods. And most recently, uh, we launched the reverse mortgage program and deferred annuity. And the and these are all are progressing quite well. Thank you, Howard. That's all. And we now welcome questions. And Mr. Ronnie Chen, Mr. Edmund Wong, Ms. Dr. Tan, Dr. Ho Wang Yin Chet, 
Chan Kin Po, Wong Ying Hong. Any other members would like to speak? If not, I'll draw the line here. Four minutes per member. First, Mr. Ronnie Chen. Thank you, Chairman. Two questions. First, investment return of the exchange fund. Last year, well, it recorded a low return, but still impressive. Well, the Hong Kong growth portfolio invests in some alternative assets as well. Last September, the market capitalization was, was about uh, $94 million and private equity about three hundred seven, and the property $19.1 billion. That's from this year. Uh, you have left the capitalization limit one a uh, one third of the total fund. In this uh, private equity and property investment, even though you have raised the cap, I wonder, would you set a cap on these two type of asset classes? And since the HKGP are mainly invested by real estate and managers and fund managers, just now the CEO mentioned about the relationship between interest rates and stock market performance. For this, uh, commission managers, have you adjusted your investment guidance to adjust to this market trend? Uh, third question: Arthur just now mentioned about the pre-approved principal moratorium is currently under review. Uh, Mr. Chen, can you? Turn on your cam. We can't see your face. Can you see me now? Some claim that uh, by delaying the announcement, the HKMA will withdraw from the scheme uh, later. Well. Before the expiry on the end of April, when would you make an announcement? End of February or end of March? Just to give the public an idea and prepare ahead. Mr. Eddie Yu, for the Hong Kong growth portfolio, yes, we did make some changes to give us more flexibility and latitude as the investment returns. As of oh, last September, the annualized returns was at 15.3 percent, whereas for the proportion of the real estate and private equity, well, we do have some rough guidelines about a 70 or cap at 70 and 30 percent. It very much depends on what kind of opportunities present itself in market conditions. Well, the partners we appointed in this challenging investment environment, the guideline is, is to, uh, which manager are we uh, selecting? Right now, we're not only preferring the speculative ones or uh, buying companies on the cheap, but rather they could able to improve the company governance and improve their profitability. This kind of Value at the organic growth uh, will uh, bring us good returns in whatever kind of environment. In terms of the exit of the principal moratorium, well, we propose uh, uh, we join uh, gradually. Well, that was before the Omicron. Now that our economy is, is under a lot of pressure. On this, uh, we do have a coordination mechanism with different banks. We are currently in discussion. We need to strike a balance. I hope that we can come to a decision soon, since the arrangement shall expire end of April. Hope that we can give some clear indication ASAP. Thanks, Mr. Edmund Wong. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question for the Hong Kong MA. 
Many institutions, including virtual banks, offer the buy now, pay later service. Although the EC reported an improvement in the credit growth in the past decade, we see an upward trend of loans taken out by uh, the younger generation, and it seems that uh, such trend will continue to rise. Now, I understand the HKMA has noticed the uh, buy now, pay later platforms, and that uh, conditions will, will be attached. But there will be other buy now, pay later services launched and promoted, especially via third party platforms. And many young people may not have um, the necessary financial discipline or knowledge. Now, we don't want to see a situation in which young people take out loans they couldn't afford to repay, thereby affecting the credit rating of their parents. Last year, the Consumer um, Protection Agency in the United States announced some measures uh, requiring banks to make disclosure and control the relevant credit risk. Now, I wonder if um, the HAM way will, will introduce similar arrangements to disseminate uh, information to the young consumers. Now, a week ago, when we introduced the uh, work priorities of the HKMA at the press conference, we said we've noticed the uh, trend of buy now, pay later picking up, and we also noticed some platforms offering this service to consumers locally. So, in terms of banking supervision, we are going to focus on disclosure of information and also uh, disclosure of terms in the contract. The second aspect is a chargeback arrangement in the event of something goes wrong. And what chargeback mechanism should be put in place to protect consumers? I will look into these issues. Now, earlier, um, some people asked whether we would uh, regulate uh, buy now, pay later services. Our focus is on uh, banking regulation, and we will focus on the services provided by banks. Thank you, HKMA, for the response. Thank you, Chairman. Next, Dr. Tan Yue Heng. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, um, Mr. Yu, Chief Executive of HKMA. I have um, three questions first on bad debts in banks. What is the ratio? The ratio last year of bad debts relating to mainland loans was 0 0.81 percent. Um, overall speaking, in Hong Kong, the ratio stands at 0 0.91 percent. May I know if this is an upward trend? Because in the mainland, property developers uh, experience um, credit crunch last year. So I wonder if the risk would affect Hong Kong. And in terms of um, the this issue, uh, what measures uh, does the HAMA have? The second question is the exchange fund reaped a 3.61% investment return last year. But in terms of um, investment in Hong Kong uh, or in equities, the investment um, return stand stood at 12.4 billion. So the investment return last year was only 0.41%. Uh, what is the reason? The third question is again related to the exchange fund. The majority of investments of exchange fund relate to private equity, which is a major uh, category. But there is a problem. Um, that is, there is a, a reverse trend. After the uh, company is listed, the uh, shares tend to go down despite high o opening prices. 
So um, I have a question on uh, the uh, cash flow issue. See, let me first answer the second and third question, and then Arthur can answer the first question. About last year's investment income from uh, equity invest or bond investment. Last year it was quite difficult because of U.S. inflation. And there is a market expectation that U.S. interest will go up. That is why we expected the interest to go up and bond prices to go down. Because of uh, the drop in bond prices, uh, we reaped a smaller income. Now, from bonds, we also receive interest income, and that's that accounts for a drop in the income as well. <laughs> and this trend continues this year. We expect us to uh, face some headwinds. As for alternative investments, as I mentioned, the most important point is that. Um, is the performance of the company acquired now for companies not yet listed and not yet sold to other uh, companies there should be an independent auditor Um, making valuation based on the cash flow and the market price. And that is why independent auditors are engaged for the purpose of um, evalu uh, pro for the purpose of valuation. I'm sorry, uh, in the interest of time, I will now have to stop you and uh, start with another member, Dr. Wong Yun San. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, CE. Two questions relating to CBDC. I understand the Hong Kong MA and the PBOC Digital Currency Research Institute are looking into the cross-boundary payment using ECNY, and you are approaching the next phase of technical testing, and more banks will be uh, invited to join the testing phase. May I ask the Hong Kong MA to consider whether in the next phase the the general public will be allowed to participate in the testing of ECNY. Now, ECNY has been launched in over 10 cities during the Winter Olympic Games, and e Hong Kong dollar, you're looking into it as well. I wonder if you work with the um, PBOC to consider the dual currency wallets comprising both ECNY and e Hong Kong dollar. Uh, you can set a credit limit, you can set a merchant list and allow Hong Kong people to use the dual currency wallet uh, so that we can be incorporated in the national development plan. Two questions. First, about the next phase of testing of ECNY. In fact, there's been a delay. The PBOC uh, has delayed the testing phase in Hong Kong because of the testing progress in the Winter Olympics in the mainland. Now we are discussing with the PBOC on incorporating more banks. We also want to expand the merchants list as well. Next phase, of course, uh, if possible, we do welcome uh, participation uh, in the testing phase by the general public. However, um, the uh, PBOC is quite prudent in gradually expanding the uh, target users. Now, e Hong Kong dollar, um, as I mentioned just now, we are studying the feasibility and gauging the demand and possible scenarios. And we're looking into other policy issues by the middle of this year. I think we'll be able to form initial views and announce such to the public. And by then, we will also consider how this will be connected to ECNY. But one point to note is that if we want to make ECNY convenient for Hong Kong, 
consumers dual currency wallet may be one option. The other option is to use a faster payment system. Uh, say FPS is uh, very very familiar uh, to Hong Kong people, and that if you want to use um, e dollar on the mainland, you can just use FPS and have the e Hong Kong dollar transferred to your digital wallet. We're considering different scenarios to facilitate Hong Kong consumers. Next, Mr. Chan Kin Po. Chairman, my first question is on page 42. That is about household debt or gross household debt. You see a significant growth in uh, loans for other private purposes. I understand that uh, these are un um, secured loans. So uh, I wonder if you'll be able to control the risk. The other is about uh, close to 900 billion uh, renminbi deposit, which is very good. And uh, one important point in Hong Kong is that we should fulfill our mission to facilitate the internationalization of renminbi. So may I know the upcoming measures to promote renminbi internationalization. The third question is about exchange fund. Uh, for the full year is uh, one point, uh, for, uh, 14 billion dollars. I'm concerned about the bond investment performance. Now uh, the bond prices are expected to continue to uh, plummet and uh, how are you going to rein in the risk? First, about loan for other private purposes. These are mostly private bank loans. Private bank loans are used for the purpose of investment in um, bonds or in equities, and uh, they're used as security or collateral. Now, we do keep a close eye on uh, such loans uh, to make sure proper valuation is done in terms of risk control. Internationalization of renminbi, we work in two directions. One is um, mutual ac market access. We have a number of stock connect or, or rather connect schemes. And there is room to further expand, um, say, the uh, South Bank trading under Bond Connect uh, or, or uh, Wealth Management Connect. The other point is how we should use renminbi internationally, and Hong Kong is a testing ground. Now, it hinges on a number of matters, such as uh, renminbi products and renminbi denominated securities. This is our current focus, um, as well as bonds. The other point is how we support the flow of capital and flow of renminbi in the market. And we're considering ways to further facilitate the circulation of renminbi to support uh, the capital market activities. The third question is valuation, or, pro or rather bond investment and um, risk management. In the past two years, we've been shortening the tenor of bonds that we've purchased so that we will not be uh, affected by um, substantial interest hikes. Of course, even in the short term, we will be um, affected. But in terms of uh, cash as liquidity, we have increased in proportion. Now, you know that uh, interest for cash deposits are lower, but we need to uh, be on the defense as well. The other point is we need to diversify our bond investment, and this is the approach we've taken in the past few years. Thank you. Next, Mr. Wong Yingho. Please switch on the mic. Am I coming through? Thank you, Chairman. A question for the Hong Kong MA. Recently, we have multinational cross-boundary Financial institutions, including banks and other financial institutions, reflecting this view to me. Now, their operations are subject to great difficulty because of the stringent quarantine and anti epidemic measures adopted by the government. So, could the Hong Kong MA tell me whether 
such anti-epidemic and quarantine measures uh, have affected their operations? And can you quantify the impact? We have 900 billion renminbi deposits in Hong Kong. Do you have a roadmap? Do you have um, any target of um, wider use of renminbi in Hong Kong? The third point, it seems that uh, the um, the former CE Norman Chen is promoting the use of regional currency, comprising the currencies in the mainland, uh, Japan, and Korea for settlement. What is your view? On the impact uh, brought about by anti epidemic measures on uh, banking talents is rather a global issue. In terms of uh, multinational financial institutions, uh, um, the epidemic or the pandemic poses uh, difficulty in the deployment of talents. Now, on the one hand, we need to keep out the virus and at the same time we need to uh, attract talents or allow the deployment of talents uh, this is a difficult task especially when Hong Kong is an international financial center we do need to allow the travel of um, banking talents and we have uh, the, the banks have taken a flexible approach now they make good use of technology I visited some banks and they have the green tech rooms available so that they can work uh, in C2 uh, without the need to travel. And for uh, international talents, uh, in the event their travel uh, traveling arrangements are affected, whether it's possible to have short-term training for local talents. We don't know when this uh, pandemic will end, but uh, gradually it will ease uh, and normalcy will be returned. However, we do see opportunities in Hong Kong. This is also understood by financial institutions as well. Be it opportunities in the mainland, the green finance, etc. These are the merits we have in attracting foreign talents in the medium to the long term. And uh, the uh, the quarantine measures may affect the um, the uh, talents in the short term, but we remain attractive to them in the medium to long run. As for green finance, if you have mainland visitors or businessmen in Hong Kong coming to Hong Kong, how we should you how we can allow them to use ECNY and how we can uh, allow um, them to uh, settle in the ECNY. And the other point is when Hong Kong people travel to the mainland, how we can use ECNY and use their wallet. Now, this doesn't happen at the retail level, but uh, in the level, uh, the level of capital markets. And I think um, in the future, the consideration will be mostly based on uh, retail use of ECNY. As for round dollar, um, I don't think I'm in a position to comment. I think this is a rather innovative idea um, floated by um, Sir Chan. I think a, a further discussion is warranted. Thank you, Eddie. After I drew the line to members put up their hand, Mr. Tommy Chow and Mr. Lam Sun Kong. Well, uh, to be fair, if I allow them to speak, I need to ask all other members who would like to speak for the first time. If not, I will allow them to speak. Mr. Tommy Chow, three minutes each. Just a quick query. Well, let's ask about the 100% uh, personal loan. 100% uh, SME guarantee scheme. I would like to know about the default rate. Or you can supplement in writing later. I'm glad to hear from Mr. Yu that you will not do anything due to the Omicron wave. And last month, I publicly asked the financial secretary to step up the 100% loan guarantee scheme commitment as a lot of the SMEs and the restaurants are 
hit very hard during Christmas and the Chinese New Year. I hope that the financial secretary can increase the commitment now, so they can get some relief. I hope that you can stay put for now and come up with the amount to help the SMEs. While we understand the pain of the SME, we try to be as accommodating as possible in terms of banking measures. How would you have the data on the default rate? For the 100% loan character scheme since it's launched to now, the default rate is about 0.5%. So far, it is within our estimate. Well, some companies are still in a payment, a principal moratorium. Well, uh, we still need to monitor uh, future changes. Next, Mr. Lamson Kang. And thank you, Chairman. Just a same quick question for Mr. Yu. The HKMA plan to launch the payment arrangements for property transactions bypassing the legal firms when you plan to launch this arrangement in a few days i will be discussing this with the banks association i want to know about the timeline i will take this question thank you mr lamb Well, I will be joining that meeting as well. By then, we can discuss the details. Our goal is to launch it as soon as possible. Well, however, in migrating to this new arrangements, the banks will need to refine their processes and draft some legal documents. Therefore, we're asking the banks to prepare ahead. That will take a few months. Once we hammer out the whole arrangements, and we're also discussing with the legal sector, once we finalize the details, and we can launch it in a few months. And we'll discuss the specifics in a few days. Thank you. Well, the government cannot be certain all the time. On this, uh, he can be quite uh, accurate that the con new and the confirmed cases can increase exponentially. Well, there will be over 600 new cases today. Well, the Hong Kong economy is going to be battered. I can tell the HKME and the government not only is the caseload rising exponentially, well, companies of all sizes will be in trouble or even close. Well, let me borrow the language. Collapse exponentially. Well, while they're catching their last breath, you should pump them some oxygen to save them. Well, I know it's not the HKMA to decide. In such a critical moment, uh, please consider relaunching the employment support scheme. Well, I hope the government can decide on the amount soon. Well, I've been keeping in touch with the HKMA uh, management on the uh, principal holiday uh, scheme. Well, before the China New Year, things were stable back then. Well, if uh, things are going smooth, we can consider it exiting. However, it is unlikely that you can exit anytime soon. Instead, China government 
extend the principal payment holiday scheme, and how you shouldn't wait to the last minute before it's telling us because a lot of people need to plan ahead. I see this of a great urgency. How do you extend it? Another six months or so on? The HKM is supportive of the banks on this scheme. However, some banks are not really enthusiastic. I'm not talking about the so the banks, a lot of uh, the banks are supporting of local enterprises. However, some of the c companies are really pushing some other companies off the cliff. You have to find out. You have to plead with them. You, uh, you have to plead with them on the importance of saving our companies. And the chief executive mentioned about that it's quite likely for an interest hike, maybe by three or four times in the U.S. Will Hong Kong follow in lockstep? That's quite important. We're not talking about uh, are we making a lot of profit. They actually are worrying how to meet their expenses. A lot of the SMNEs in all walks of life notice that the pandemic situation deteriorating globally. Well, less for even for the restaurant and trading and import export Everyone is running a higher level of risk. Recently, the banks have decided to close some of their branches and sent their staff work from home due to uh, their staff getting infected. If some of the transactions could not be closed on time, I hope that the HKM can issue some guidelines to allow oh, more flexibility. If it's just one or two days or behind, uh, which would cause the company or individuals to default or incur great loss or even to close. This is the last thing we want to see. Well, I'm simply summing up other members' concern. I wonder if Mr. Yu can reply. Uh, thank you, Chairman. First, on the interest hikes. Well, this year the U.S. would definitely uh, raise its rates. Well, the Hong Kong's pace may be lagging behind. As we need to wait the interest spread to reach a certain extent, causing an outflow of uh, capital before we can take action. Since we do have a high li liquidity, we may not be able to uh, follow right away. There will be uh, some buffer period. As for difficulty as the SMNEs, we perfectly understand this. I hope that we can do all we can to support and help them. In such challenging times, that we we need to be more accommodating. Let's say um, uh, for those a slight delay, uh, uh, well, the banks can have the flexibility, and we will issue guidelines. And we can also discuss with the banks how to support SME through the coordination mechanism. If members know of some examples, well, since we uh, may not know as many in the sector, if you know any companies that need help, please refer them to us and we can follow up with the individual banks. We can all do our bit uh, to throw a lifeline to the struggling SMEs. Uh. 
I just like to reiterate that all members of here support economic development in Hong Kong and we all support enterprises in Hong Kong big and small so I hope in these dire times the government could do more as soon as possible to help SMEs without SMEs support our economy will be in the doldrums so for the questions and suggestions uh, put forward by members, please uh, do your utmost to help as quickly as possible. That's the end of today's um, item. I thank the Hong Kong MA representatives. Uh, next item, budget for the Securities and Futures Commission for the financial year 2022-2023. Let me welcome representatives from the Financial Services and the Treasury Bureau as well as the SFC to our meeting. So members, if you wish to ask questions, please indicate by uh, using the raise hand function. Now I invite Mr. Tim Loy, Chairman of the SFC, to walk us through the paper. Please be uh, as succinct as possible, please. Thank you, Chairman. Members of the panel, I'm happy to be here with Mr. Alder, Chief Executive Officer of the SFC and other representatives to um, attend this meeting. Members may have noticed in our budget that for the current financial year 2021-22, we forecast a deficit of $184 million in the beginning, but our latest forecast is that we'll be able to have a surplus and that for this year we have a budget we have a surplus of 193 million dollars for the average daily turnover of the security markets in the first 7 months um, we recorded uh, 100 uh, we, we recorded an increase by $123 million, and this represents the major source of income for the SFC. Because of the financial status of the SFC, uh, we're in a very good position, and we consider that we are in uh, dire straits amidst the pandemic. We're going to continue to grant a license fee waiver for the upcoming year. In the next financial year, the revenue foregone estimated is $244 million. In the past 13 years, I mean, in 10 out of the past 13 years, we had the same fee waiver for licensees. In preparing the next budget, we will review the situation Despite the revenue foregone, in the next financial year, we should be able to balance the books. Now, according to the paper we, uh, sub we've submitted, we um, project a surplus of $14 million for the upcoming financial year. Assuming that uh, we have an average uh, securities markets turnover of $147 billion. Um, there will be a um, forecast income of, uh, or estimated income of $2.372 billion. Now, the uh, levy has been lowered from 0 0.005 to 0 0.0027% which only accounted for 1.3% of the total transaction cost and it based on this some based on this levy rate we need we can only balance the book if we achieve 140 billion dollars of daily ter, uh, average daily turnover in a well, as far as expenditure is concerned, um, the estimated recurrent expenditure for the coming year is uh, $2.359 billion. And um, 
staff costs account for the largest proportion of uh, expenditure. We propose 30 new headcount uh, for the coming year, and there will be an upgrade of 32 positions. We've, been, we've uh, frozen the uh, size of establishment for the past two years, and we need to create new headcounts to ensure we're adequately staffed to meet the growing demand and cope with um, the uh, increasing complexity and scope of um, the respective roles of work. And there are also other dedicated uh, items and special projects, for example, regulating fintech and the regulation regime over spec recently introduced, and we also propose to engage up to 50 project staff. We notice that uh, there is a talent crunch in the financial market at the moment, and we need to ensure that the remuneration and offers of the SFC are competitive enough. We already make a um, reservation for a 4.5% pay increase for the annual pay adjustment. However, we need to consider um, the final uh, pay increase depending on the market situation and the financial situation. Now, there, we had a very severe uh, competition for talents, and the wastage rate increased from 3.1% to 12% in uh, 2020. For junior professionals, the wastage rate was as high as 25%. In 2020, we moved to Island East, but as part of our long-term strategy for office accommodation, our focus is on acquiring our own office premises. So we'll continue to ring fence part of our re reserve for the purpose uh, for this purpose so that we can acquire our own com accommodation in the end. We've been able to make a rental saving of $125 million annually, and we have transferred the uh, saving to ring fence reserves. The ring fence reserves will increase to $3.375 billion by the 31st of March 2023. For non-ring fence reserves, we estimate that it will be reduced to $4.5 billion, um, which means that the total reserves will stand at $7.895 billion. Depending on the situation in the financial year and also the uh, medium range forecast, we will uh, review the re reserves and the levy um, rates to be imposed. And if necessary, the rates will need to uh, be advised to cope with um, changes, and by then we will uh, make recommendations to the financial secretary. Finally, Mr. Uh, Ashley Alder and myself would be happy to take questions from members. Thank you. Thank you. Any other representatives who would like to speak except Tim? Uh, just you, all right. All right, I'll open the floor to members. We have Mr. Wong Shun Sek, Dr. Wong Yun Shan, Mr. Robert Lee, uh, Dr. Tan Yue Heng, Mr. Ronick Chen, Mr. Lam Sun Kung, Mr. Long Chi Wing. Any other members who'd like to ask questions? If not, I'll draw a line here. I'd like to give each member four minutes. That means we'll need to extend today's meeting. I'll announce the extension by the time. We start with Mr. Wong Jun Sek. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, SFC for uh, Chairman for your briefing. Now I'd like to uh, mention. I I'd like to ask about the SFC's cooperation with the uh, China Securities Commission uh, Futures Commission, especially under the National 14 Five Year Plan. Whether there are uh, any specific discussions, the, the mainland is our hinterland. So, in terms of facilitating RMB's internationalization and mutual market access, 
with the mainland. I wonder if there are um, relevant discussions with the uh, mainland commission. Let me take Mr. Wong's question and Ashley, if need be, you can supplement. Now, Mr. Wong, the SFC has a very close uh, working relationship with the uh, CSRC. And on a number of topics, we keep regular and close liaison. Our staff closely liaise with their staff on a regular basis, especially in terms of uh, different areas of our work. At a higher level, well, we do have high-level meetings with the uh, CSRC to resolve um, quite a number of issues. Now, you mentioned the mutual market access mechanism the initial design, implementation, other enhancement measures. And on these matters, we continue to uh, discuss with the CSRC. And recently, in light of the uh, policies rolled out on the mainland, for example, new measures applying uh, applicable to uh, overseas listed companies. We have been liaising very closely with them, and we've been offering our comments to them. All in all, I'd say we have a satisfactory working relationship with the CSRC. I'll see if Ashley has anything to supplement. So. Um the, um, as Tim indicated, the, the relationship that we have with the CSRC <coughs> is actually really, really crucial because uh, Hong Kong's position as an international financial center is uh, in large part based on capital market connectivity between international capital and the China markets uh, and into the Hong Kong market. Uh, and so the discussions that we have with the CSRC, which extend back some years, which are daily, basically, is all about uh, the degree to which or the, the way in which we as uh, two regulators uh, are able to manage the risks around greater cross-border connectivity whilst con continuing to promote a broadening of market access, basically. And so just a recent examples you might have seen is that we uh, there was an announcement just before um, the end of last year around uh, ETF Connect, in other words, exchange traded funds being included in the Connect system. And then just uh, a few weeks prior to that, uh, the launch of Asia Index Futures in Hong Kong. And that was really, really significant because it basically was the first time in Hong Kong that uh, global investors uh, could hedge their risks arising from their exposures to and participation in mainland markets through uh, Stock Connect and other mechanisms. And, enable, and, and, and being able to do that basically means they're able to increase uh, the level of exposure because they're hedging their risks in a way that's very efficient. And you may have seen that that contract in itself has been one of the most successful product launches ever uh, uh, in the market here. So but I'm happy to supplement. I know time is short, but uh, there's a, it's, a, it's a large subject, um, the, the whole question of uh, how we, or the, the, the characteristics of how we uh, operate vis-a-vis uh, -vis the CSRC. Right, thank you. Next, Dr. Wong Yushan, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I thank the F SFC. Now, three questions on Hong Kong status as an asset management center. According to Section 6 of SFO, Subsection 2, the SFC should have regard to um, maintaining competitive edge uh, of Hong Kong as an international financial center. Now, my point is, um, in terms of attracting capital um, and also hedge funds and the time needed for them to get licensed. Now, in Singapore, 
the undertaking is four months before one can get a license. Now, the SFC in Hong Kong gives a pledge, and that um, the if the application will be processed in 15 weeks. In reality, practitioners have told me that um, the time taken could be as long as six months, given the time needed to prepare documentation. So, SFC. Uh, my question for SFC is whether the uh, it has an accurate estimate of the time needed um, for a license to be granted, and for the service culture and performance pledge. How does the SFC make sure that it will be convenient for a company to to uh, operate asset management in Hong Kong? Third question: Whether we'll follow. Um, Singapore and set up a second tier licensing regime to expedite the process of uh, license application for people to conduct business and bolster Hong Kong status as an IFC. Mr. Lui. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Wang's question. As for the processing time for issuing the licenses, we reviewed our own operations. Our performance pledge is 15 weeks. From our records, if all the uh, submissions are complete, were we able to meet this uh, pledge 100%? For some cases, they may not file uh, all the documents requested, uh, we need to call them, and sometime midway through, they make some revisions. So there were some cases which may appear to take longer. However, when all the documents were submitted, we were able to fully meet our performance pledge. As for how can we attract the asset management companies to Hong Kong, compared to Singapore, Hong Kong has its own strengths. We know from a lot of figures that the AUM in Hong Kong is leading Singapore. For SFC, we are more than happy to uh, attract more companies to Hong Kong and a, if they meet our requirements to set up shop in Hong Kong. And for your last question, is well, how do we attract smaller asset management companies and whether we should set up a second tier uh, licensing regime for them? Let me. Uh, I'll turn over to Ashley. Sorry, time's up. I hope that the questions can be a lot more succinct and the answers can be succinct as well. I suppose that uh, we can uh, supplement in writing to, to Dr. Wang. Next, Mr. Li Wei Wang. Uh, thank you, SFC, f for the budget paper. I believe that the industry is willing to work with the regulator to create a highly transparent market. And I'd like to thank the SFC for able to extend the annual licensing fee waiver. This is uh, quite important for the sector at this stage. Well, I'm asking for my sector. As I noticed, the expenditure has increased by 11.5%. Well, you have uh, at more 30 new full-time staff and 50 contracts project staff. If you have a headcount of over 1,000 and each on a salary of 1.6 million and based on the adjustments of salary adjustment 4.5 percent 
well, uh, from last July and August, the market turnover declined sharply, and a lot of the IPO had been called off. I hope that. I wonder if you, you can downsize in line with the industry, especially the sector is facing increased regulatory pressure. And if you in, keep on increasing headcount, I hope that you can say something about this. Mr. Loy, Mr. Ashley, we take this question. I, I think we, we are very, very careful to um, uh, calibrate our headcount and the overall size of a headcount and the jobs that our people do to the real need of the market. And in particular, the way in which we do this is in part directed to making sure that we are more efficient than less efficient. Um, so I, I don't think that the, uh, that the increased headcount should pose any further burden or additional burden on the industry, if anything, the opposite. Uh, and then separately, we're very, very conscious of uh, the fact that we are broadly set up in a financial position where we will not be a, an additional burden on the taxpayer, certainly not this year and certainly not anytime soon. But having, regard, having said that, uh, we are very, very careful to make sure that um, our, our headcount decisions and indeed our pay decisions are, are optimal uh, to ensure the outcome, which is uh, efficient but firm regulation, but no further burden on the market, if anything, as I said earlier, uh, greater efficiency, which should be beneficial to all. Thank you. Uh, Next, Dr. Tan Kwok Heng. Uh, Dr. Tan Yu Cheng. Thank you, um, HKMA and the SFC chairman. I have some suggestion. Just now in the report, over the past year, the SFC has a huge turnover, as high as 25%. This is quite a high percentage. For the coming year, well, the Hong Kong will still need a prosperous financial market. Besides this 4.5% salary adjustment, is there any other way to retain and attract talent and reduce the turnover? Second, since last year, Hong Kong's IPO's application is on the rise. However, the pace of listing has slowed down. A lot of companies are waiting to be listed, especially that with the a green lighting of the spec. There would, there would be a green backlog of company waiting to be listed while you are slowing down the vetting. Well, therefore, we do need to add more headcount to SFC. Have you considered adding more contract staff to? Try to boost the efficiency of vetting IPOs and the corporate finance division. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chen. So your question were about the turnover, staff turnover. Just now we we'll talked about it was quite severe. Therefore, the SFC We'll take a multi prong approach to stabilize the situation. First, uh, about the remuneration. We made some arrangements. Our view is that this 4.5% pay adjustment is to figure. Per by the consultant. However, our eventual figure what what the exact level we SFC will still need to look at other uh, data. 
for example the inflation rate and so on before coming to a final decision second we try to provide more promotion opportunities for our staff that's why we are upgrading quite a number of positions and hope that we hope to diversify their duties at the SFC they will have the opportunities to be work at different departments to provide more uh, variety at work that's uh, some of the ways to try to retain them as for your second question the vetting of uh, IPO applications well every year there are about, uh, quite a few hundred company waiting to be listed the workload is huge this year we are adding more manpower on this we're adopting a front-loaded approach on vetting when they come to us we'll check we have there are no issues that will uh, refer to the HKEX we spot any problems with the application we will talk to them hopefully in the shortest possible time we can fix this issues Mr. Lloyd please be consent in order for the listing to go ahead if there are any issues with applications we'll make alternative arrangements therefore we're adding more manpower to cope with increasing workload to improve the backlog before I invite the next member to speak three members are waiting for their turn I've decided to extend the meeting by 20 minutes till 1250 next Mr. Ronick Chan Well, for the annual budget of SFC, it mentioned the turnover rose from 5% to 12%. Well, we need talent to stay competitive as a financial hub. While the core functions of the SFC is to monitor Hong Kong securities and futures markets. What changes in terms of regulatory personnel with such high turnover will it affect uh, SFC regulatory work and second in terms of manpower planning in your annex 3.1 you mentioned that you will upgrade the staff grades of the position of 31 I noticed the corporate finance provision made up of eight the highest of all the divisions so for the may I ask the SFC by upgrading more positions in this division in the due to market competition or any other kind of factors. Therefore you decided to allocate the most staff position upgrades to that division. And for the SFC and the Secretary Hui mentioned about regulating virtual assets. Just now Secretary Hui said that the SFC shall be responsible for the licensing and for the transactional level the HKMA will be responsible for um, regulating them on this the HKMA at the FCFC will you meet up regularly so that you will have a there were no blind spots in regulation actually we'll take this question levels of staff turnover affect our work well the answer is straightforward answer is yes uh in that you know if people are leaving who are experienced it takes time to recruit and then train to the same or even better level 
uh, those that we're recruiting. So there's always a lag. So it does uh, uh, mean that there is additional pressure uh, on the staff uh, who are with us. Uh, because ultimately they're being asked to, um, we're being, the, the staff as a whole are being asked to produce the same amount of work with fewer people. So that must mean that there's additional pressure. Um, but I, I think the way in which we're approaching this, which is both to look at pay levels, to look at promotional uh, promotion opportunities, et cetera, is the right way to do it. Um, so we hope that this year with those sort of measures, uh, the position will be stabilized. The second point was about corporate finance. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, corporate finance does, you know, th th we've got a new SPAC regime, you know, uh, coming into, um, into operation this year. Uh, we've got uh, the whole question of uh, a number of companies listed in the United States, the so-called homecoming uh, listings. Uh, and we've also got the question this year of the degree to which there may be further reform of the listing rules. Uh, it's early days, but that's something. So that's why we concentrated um, uh, a lot around uh, corporate finance uh, in terms of headcount and uh, uh, et cetera. And then so far as virtual assets are concerned, yeah, absolutely. You know, virtual assets, um, the, whole, the whole area is one that is cross-sectoral without any doubt. So it is really, really important that we work hand in hand with the MA around this as we develop regulation across the piece. So you may have seen that only a few days ago, we issued um, joint circulars with the MA uh, around this uh, in order to, and that was really around how we expect banks and licensed corporations to operate when it comes to their, the intersection with virtual assets and their clients. But I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, alumni Thank you, Mr. Lamson. Kern, I see your hand is appearing. Have you decided not to speak or did you press the wrong button? It's your turn. Mr. Lamson Kern, please switch on the mic. I'm sorry, thank you, Chairman. The threshold for IPO listing um, is has now been changed. You need to have a record of eighty million dollars for the past three years. Have you made the latest assessment in terms of the number of IPOs and whether this new threshold would impact on the number of uh, listings? Now, I'd like to speak um, and relate the views of the legal profession. At the moment. The uh, vetting process for IPO listing is so stringent that it has um, exceeded the level needed for consumer protection. I want to know whether you will enhance um, liaison with a legal profession and enhance mutual understanding. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Lamb, for your questions. The first question relates to listed companies. At the moment, the IPO threshold has uh, been raised, but I understand that it should not have a significant impact on the number of IPO applications. Apart from the applications we've already received, there are also companies at the moment listed in the U.S. coming back to Hong Kong, and there are quite a number of such homecoming um, listed companies. So it should not have a significant impact on the total number of listed companies in Hong Kong. The other point about the vetting process, you mentioned that there should be more communication with the legals, uh, legal profession. Now, of course, some questions in the voting uh, in the vetting process uh, relate to consumer protection, which is crucial. And there are reasons for putting forward questions. And uh, we can only decide after these questions have been answered. But of course, in relation to more communication with the legal profession on listing matters, uh, we're happy to step up communication. Perhaps in due course, we can contact Mr. Lam and then uh, set up a meeting with the legal profession. Thank you, Chairman. Finally, Mr. Lam Chewing. 
Please switch on the mic. Thank you. Chairman. Paragraph 10 of the paper refers to details of the um, expenditure or capital expenditure and referring to the appendix. I understand that um, they've continued to have computer systems development related capital expenditure. So uh, I'd like to have um, the, a snapshot of the capital expenditure in this regard in the past 10 years. Now, the other point about vehicle replacement this year, the budget is $1.2 million for replacing the car. May I know exactly um, what car it is and the uh, use of the car? Because I think it's the public's uh, concern whether um, the SFC is sitting on huge reserves. Uh, is a signal coming through? Right. Perhaps I will invite uh, Mr. Andrew Wen to respond to your question on the car. For car replacement, the arrangement is that um, if necessary, the car will be used uh, by our staff to meet with the sector, just like today. Um, usually, for vehicle procurement, uh, we would uh, procure a bigger car to accommodate more colleagues, and uh, we like to go green and try to procure a greener vehicle, perhaps a hybrid or electric vehicle instead of a fuel-propelled car. I think the member also referred to IT. Indeed, there are two parts to our IT system development. One is under P&L, we have information technology expenses. The other is capital costs. It comes under capital expenditure. I mean, a portion of it as part of the capital expenditure. It includes um, work on our technical infrastructure or some programs, applications that we develop on our own in terms of our supervisory work. We need to use the software to track the market developments and track market activities. Well, this system, once set up, can be used for a long horizon. So uh, it's put under capital expenditure, allowing annual depreciation. So for IT expenditure, it's about over slightly over 10%. I don't have information about the past year figures at hand, but it reflects uh, that um, there are more when there are more activities in the market, we can't uh, do our work manually. So that accounts for an increase in IT expenditure. But in the past two years, we haven't inc created uh, posts despite the increase in workload. So I and T helps a lot in terms of improving work efficiency. Thank you. Give some information about. I think the question was around the uh, last ten years and the expenditure. Mm -hmm. We can do that in writing. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, could you repeat? Sorry, uh, I think the question was around our expenditure on IT over the last ten years. Uh, so there could be a comparison, so we can give you that in writing. That's all I was saying. Okay, thank you. I do have a short question in relation to newly created posts. Altogether, there will be 30 new posts. There will be three under market uh, supervision for unsecured uh, market, um, you know, the measure. So about uh, going paperless, what is the uh, major obstacle 
And do we have a roadmap for implementing the uncertificated securities market in initiative? Yeah, in simple terms, it's it's uh, you know the um, the legislation is is largely in place, save for the for the um, secondary legislation and the and the associated rules. Uh, so we're uh, working with the government to put all that together now, and we're shooting for or aiming for launch of this uh, next year. The latest, in my view, should be early 2024. Realistically, it, it's a it's a very complex uh, project. But I think we've been working on this, in a sense, for far too long. <laughs> now it was it had its origin around 20 years ago. So I'm very, very keen that uh, we wrap this up and launch it uh, as soon as we can. So uh, although don't hold me to it, I think uh, uh, to, by the end of next year is the current aim to launch. You know, we, we, we just can't keep on issuing consultation paper. Yeah. Every day we are talking about green, green, green. You know, this is something that is very good for not just Hong Kong, you know, for environment. So we hope uh, this will, uh, we, we will see it uh, happen uh, within SFC as soon as possible. Uh, thank you for looking after that, Ashley and Tim. Uh, All right, no other questions? I thank the government and SFC representatives for coming to our meeting. Next item, any other business? Nothing from me under AOB, Any um, anything proposed by members under AOB? If not, uh, that's the end of today's meeting. Thank you.